If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode, uh, we interview and talk to and get interviewed by Rob Dion from Open Sky Fitness. Handsome guy. Some Very good looking guy. Some <laughs> a lot of, of my, handsomeness going on here. Some of my favorite people to talk to when we do our podcasts are other uh, fitness podcasters because we love to see you know, what drives them to do what they do, what their, uh, their belief system is uh, and methodologies are when it comes to fitness and wellness. And a lot of what we talk about lines up very well with Rob. Uh, so we had a great conversation which is um, unique too, coming from L.A., where there is a lot of shenanigans down there, like based off of vanity and all these other like interesting ideas floating around from celebrities. Yeah, so. he definitely is. He's he the was extre- in that world. He, yeah, he's in the extreme of what we talk about. What's right. wrong with the industry? He lives in the heart of that and uh, shares some pretty cool stories. Uh, some of the trainers that are around him, some of the things that he's seen, mm-hmm. and also why uh, he's inspired to uh, present the message that he's presenting, which is. Very similar to a lot of what Mind Pump talks about. So, and we didn't really know this until uh, we got on the show. So it was really exciting uh, to get to know him and find out more about him. Because if you just take a quick snapshot of him, you see he's a really good looking guy who's out of. I think he has an actor background, which he talks about on the show. Yeah, we watched his commercial there. For right, a right, and you, you know, and you're not sure is this going to be like a Julian Michael type of uh, somebody who was casted to be a personal trainer? Is he legit? And he's a legit personal trainer, and he has a cool story on what what took him down that path. And mm-hmm. he has a beautiful fit wife, and they share all kinds of their recipes and health secrets on their on his Instagram too. So make sure you check out all his stuff. Yeah. So his podcast is Open Sky Fitness. Uh, their website is Open Sky Fitness. Dot com um, and his Instagram is at Open Sky Fitness. Also, uh, we have put together Maps Prime and Maps Prime Pro together in the Prime Bundle. Now we've had people ask us what's the difference between the two programs. Maps Prime, which we uh, put out first, and we put that out a little while ago, is really your. We consider it like your pre-workout. Um, you it helps you design what you do to prime your body for your workout so you could squat better and more effectively, you could deadlift better, more effectively, bench press better, more effectively. Basically, add it to whatever workout you're doing, do it mm-hmm. right before your workout as your quote-unquote warm-up and get far better results from your workout. Um, and then MAPS Prime Pro, well, that's just uh, pure correctional. I mean, it's got a self-assessment tool that covers, uh, I mean, the, the, the entire body, but really parts of the body that... You don't learn how to assess uh, anywhere else, really. In fact, the movements in Prime Pro, many of them uh, were even unfamiliar to me, Adam and Justin. We've been in the industry yeah. for you know, 15 to 20 years, um, and that's because we recruited uh, Dr. Justin Brink, who's just this incredible movement specialist, and he really helped us design MAPS Prime Pro. Well, what's cool about uh, MAPS Prime Pro, it, it we just provided another sort of an answer, a sort of a bridge between um, sometimes people may feel a little bit helpless. Like, I really want to get into the swing of things and get into, you know, working out the way I used to work out. And, um, you know, a lot of times, like, they, they need to dig deeper and they need to find out, you know, how their body, what the, the current state of their body is right now. So Think, think about it this way, you know. You have wrist pain that's kind of chronic and it happens sometimes. Or my neck tends to bother me sometimes. Or, you know, I can't do that exercise anymore because my shoulder kind of hurts. Or when I squat, I notice some knee pain or hip pain. Or I I just don't feel these muscles firing the way they should. Like, this is what Prime Pro is designed for. It literally has a self-assessment tool for the wrist and hands, your neck, your shoulders and your shoulder blades, your hips, uh, your feet, your ankles, your toes. Um, areas that are almost never covered that have huge impacts on just how you feel, um, how effective you can make your workouts, your aches and pains. I'll tell you what, if you're a personal trainer uh, or somebody that works with people in that particular regard, a chiropractor or a physical therapist or whatever, uh, this program is absolutely invaluable. And so what we've done is we've taken MAPS Prime and MAPS Prime Pro and we've combined them together and discounted them in the Prime Bundle. And you can find this at mindpumpmedia.com. And without any further ado, mm. here's our interview with Rob Dion from Open Sky Fitness. The way it works is yeah. is uh, like Doug's kind of like the father. 
mm-hmm. of the podcast. And you know, when you have kids, <laughs> do you have kids, Rob? By the I way? don't have kids. Okay, so when you yeah. have kids, if you have multiple children, as a father, as a good parent, what you do is you identify your favorite, which child. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 not, not necessarily. You identify which you, child. You know what? You shouldn't be a father, <laughs> yeah, <here>, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Okay. Yeah. You identify which child needs <laughs> needs more help. Got you know it. what I mean? So is Adam so, that so, person? Yeah. So, yeah. so Doug, Doug yeah. gives the expensive he equipment. Just goes and yeah, <laughs> right. It needs to sound good because I don't need he it. Says the guy hands all over. His says technology. the guy who sounds like fucking Kermit on here, right? Hey, listen, <laughs> that's my big tonsil. Yeah. I and got then, that. Yeah, I got that right tonsil. He turns it up and EQs them all perfect. Rob, you, Rob, where are you? Good. Where are you flying in from right now? I, I'm flying. I just flew in from LA. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just it was like a ninety-seven dollar round trip ticket, and it was like I can't fucking pass that. No, up. that's you can't. not bad. LA's no, fucking great, by the way. What a great place, huh? Yeah. Well, I love L- uh, I love I love Southern, <laughs> Southern California. I can't say that I love LA. <laughs> no, who yeah. likes LA? I don't think that many people like LA. I think only the people that grew up there like LA. Maybe. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I think everybody that moves cool there parts. falls in love with the weather, but then after that, you're maybe ten years. You're just like, wow, I need to get the fuck out of mm. here. Are you born Eventually. and raised there? No, I'm born and raised Long Island. Oh, yeah, oh there you go. Where are you guys from? Where are you're all yeah. from here, San Jose? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, San really? Jose, yeah. Yeah. Long yeah. Island, huh? That's my people. Yeah. You're around my people. That's no right. wonder I looked yeah. at you. I'm like, ah, he lives, he, you it, know, it doesn't look like he's from LA. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, I, you know, I grew up out there. I, I moved when I was, I moved into Queens when I was, uh, I don't know, 20 years old, 20, no, 25 years old. And I lasted there for about three years and I got sick of it. I came out to LA originally. I don't know. So I don't know if you guys know this about me. So I was an actor. I moved to LA to be an actor. You're and handsome. I, I could tell I was, you should be doing it. And that that's too. why my voice is very nice. It has nothing to do with this microphone right now. I've got this <laughs> locked in. <Okay>. So, <laughs> so I moved out there to be an actor because I spent the month of February out there for pilot season. The weather was ridiculous. I came back home to Queens and it was, you know, the end of February to slush, sleet, rain. It was disgusting. And I told my wife, or who was my girlfriend at the time, we're getting out of Dodge. We're, we got to go. So we moved that summer. We literally moved to just on a total whim. Let's just get out of here just because of the weather. So what kind of work did you do as an actor? Uh, Is there anything we know? <laughs> I was on, well, like I was adult on films like Justin. Jamming. I was just like Justin. I was on <laughs> lots of. I did jamming. lots and lots of adult films. I was on. Uh, I was on Guiding Light for for uh, for just like as a guest star there for a couple of episodes. What is that? Can you? Uh, I don't know what that is. What is that? Guiding Light. Yeah, it's yeah. Soap opera. Oh, okay. You don't know soap operas? Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, they, that's <laughs> no. that's since then. Since <laughs> I've been on, they've canceled it. It could. Be up, it could be because of me, but you know, I'm not exactly sure. But yeah, this is uh, it was it was like a true soap opera, like was, uh, married with or what's the children? All my children, all my children, okay. as the world turns, all yes. that crap. Okay. Yeah, I remember those ones. My mom watched those when I was a kid. Yeah, Guiding Light was huge. My mom watched it when I was a kid, and and they, my sisters and my mom, could not be more you know happy that I was on that show. Were you the were you the hot trainer boyfriend that was banging the banging the uh, wife? Were you know, you? I, no, I unfortunately that would have been awesome. I would totally <laughs> love to do that. But at the time, I wasn't even I wasn't really in that good a shape. I was I was just because I was just uh, an actor who had a, had a, like a history of being an athlete when I was a kid, but I didn't really I, that wasn't it was like a middle ground of my life where and we could talk about this because my twenties was just like a shit time in terms of being healthy. By the time I got married at thirty, I was like thirty pounds overweight. I just I looked mm-hmm. like crap, and so but anyway, I was on that show and I uh, played a detective for you know two episodes, three episodes, and and that was it. But I, I mean, I did little things here and there. But, you know, my so acting career, you wouldn't recognize me in anything. Oh, you know what I'm on? Actually, if everybody wants to Google this, if you go Google Centrum Silver strip poker commotion, strip poker commercial, no, no way. <laughs> I swear to God, if you guys want to Google it, you could totally Google it. Uh, I was on that and it's got millions and millions and millions of downloads because it's like it, uh, the guy who created this guy, Eric, who it was a spec spot. You guys know what that is? No, 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 a no. spec spot is when a director or somebody, somebody makes a makes a commercial for free, like they make it, they pay for it themselves, and then they try to sell it as like, oh, I hey, see. look to what I can, themselves. as look what I can do, oh. you yeah. know. So he made this spec spot, and it crushed. It was the coolest. It was the coolest commercial. It was about us like sitting around playing strip poker, and it's got a really good twist at the end. So you got to check it out. But right. um, but it, it they but Centrum Silver wouldn't buy it. We're on YouTube, where can we can we look it at YouTube? You can literally look it up on YouTube. Oh, it's right. on if you can Google it, it'll it'll pop up anywhere. Doug's pulling it up right All now. All right, so here it is. There I am. <laughs> That's me right there. Yes. So I, I got to tell you a quick it? quick little backstory. If you're gonna play this, it's so only you're already losing long. is what I see. Yeah. So uh, quick little backstory. So I got I got cast as the other guy's role. When and I hope he doesn't hear this because it sounds like t- I'm talking shit about him. But uh, <laughs> but I got cast as the other guy's role, and he couldn't do. He couldn't just do like a look back and forth, and you'll see it. It's like a little joke at the end there. Uh, he couldn't pull that off, so I got swapped out and actually did that right there. You see that little? That was you. Was, uh, that, was, that, was, yeah, that was it. And then you know, but you so okay. okay let's watch this thing. That's wow. It. That's my that's my lead in. Yeah. Well, and I got to. How reach, old are you right here? Uh, 
that was 2006. So that was That's a I while was 29. Ago. Yeah. Oh, you're a bunch oh, so, of old yeah. so you're, you're 40, 39, 40. I'm 40. I just turned 40. Yeah. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you very Good much. Day. Yeah, you had a yeah. lot of dark hair there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see, and you can see, I was this is before this is before I became a personal trainer or anything like that. So I, I actually I'm not in great shape. So don't make fun. Of, don't don't make fun of me. So <laughs> so so you, you so you're in guiding light. You're like I fucking made it. Like, that's right. It's that's on it. Now I'm gonna exactly. take off now. I, was, I thought I was just like gonna be vacationing. It didn't work out for you. When did you make the pivot to to fitness? Well, I was doing. It's a good question. I was doing a play. And uh, I had to take my shirt off in the play. And so I was like, fuck, I can't look like a total douchebag on this, in, yeah. on, on, you know, on stage. Uh, it was Troilus and Cressida, Shakespeare. So, you know, okay. I, was, I, I was trained. I went to a conservatory. I went to an acting conservatory. Oh, good so, deal. Um, so I had, to, I had to get in shape for this. So I was. I mean, I knew how to work out. I knew how to diet kind of at the time. And I got ripped for this for this role. One of the guys that was in the show with me, I was playing I was playing uh, Achilles, and he was playing Ajax. And I got and he was like, "How did you fucking do that? Like mm. you look insane." And I said, uh, I, "I just you know I worked out. I just dieted." And he said, um, "Well, can you train me?" And I I'm not a trainer. And he said, "Well, I'll pay you to do it." And I said, "Okay, well, sure." And so I did it, and I felt like a total hack for like the first three months, six months I was training him. He was getting good results, and then I went and got my certification, and I got my advanced certifications all through NASM, uh, but also CrossFit. Got into CrossFit for a while. We can talk about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, no, you guys feel Until about you got that. Hurt. Uh, yeah, you're 100 percent right. You're not even. You're, that's why I stopped. I well, totally I blew my shoulder out, and, my, and I had like a yeah a C67 herniation. So. Oh shit! <laughs> yeah, totally fucked Damn, myself dude. up. Sorry about that. No, yeah. that's all right. So uh, so yeah, so that guy asked me to train him, and and that was basically. Basically, me off and running. He actually lost 100 pounds in the first in the first year and wow. a half. Uh, he's one of my best friends. I was at his wedding. He's a fantastic guy. So now, do you have do you, have you fallen now in love with training as much as you were with acting, or is this something like you do on the side while you still want to do acting? How do, I mean, yeah. I, well, do I want to do acting? Not really. I mean, I love doing podcasting. I love being able to talk like this because I feel like I get to perform, mm -hmm. and that's one outlet. I feel I, like I you're do, too good looking for podcasting. I do. Like you, see, I this is face, really good. So you for guys us. have faces for radio yes but, yeah. uh, thank you asshole <laughs> get this guy out of here <laughs> pointing out the obvious here but you know it's like uh, I, I you know if I could if I literally could Doug if you want to sign on uh, you know if I could afford to spend the time doing videos and stuff like that and YouTube work I would it's just it, there's so much I'm trying to juggle my personal training career as well as my mm -hmm. online posting you know my my podcasting and all that content it's creation. a monster it's a monster of amount of work to do and also then be healthy at the same time and try to figure that shit out, right. you know, which we all do. And actually I have remind me cause I, I, I posted in my Facebook group that uh, I was coming on the show today and they, some of the people, they're like, Oh my God, my two favorite podcasts are coming together, <laughs> which is actually kind of cool. Um, cool. So, uh, so they, they, there was a couple it's like, if you guys have any questions, let me know. I'll throw them in the, I'll throw them in the show and these guys can answer. Oh if you yeah. Want. Pull them up, dude. We'll, yeah. Yeah, 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 we'll yeah, fire those up in just, in just a little bit. Yeah. But, yeah. We do Q and A's all the time. Here, exactly. So yeah, no, that's a really good idea that's cool so good deal so uh so with fitness you got into fitness did you fall in love with it after you started training this guy and yeah i did and you know i i fell in love with the fitness aspect of it i also fall, fell in love with the business aspect of it i really did i i ended up doing this that's this got to be tough though because you're in i mean the fitness in we talk, we rail against the fitness industry quite a bit yeah. and of course it, all of the whole fitness industry isn't the same mm -hmm. but a lot of the fitness industry that gets the attention that makes the money is yeah. the parts that we really don't like the ones right. that six pack abs kind yeah, of shit like that yeah and they right. lie and the, you know the yeah. snake oil and the sham and all that bullshit and yeah. uh, you know the photoshop pictures and all that stuff and you're like literally in the epicenter of that you're in yeah. LA which is yeah. like that's the that's where a lot of it comes out of. Yeah. Uh, when you got into fitness, you you you. What made you love it, and what made did you see that right away? Did you? And you were also yeah. in acting. Shit. I, I mean, acting is right along the lines, right, with that kind of stuff. Yeah, totally. I I was trying to figure out what my what my angle was going to be as mm -hmm. a personal trainer. Um, I knew that it was right around the time the P ninety X came out, mm -hmm. right, or maybe P ninety X or P ninety X two. I can't remember at the time, but. Tony Horton was huge at the time, and he had all that crap about muscle confusion and everything like that. Uh, I've, had him on, I've had him on my show. Um, but, but hey, Tony. Yeah, he's, he's great. Guy. What's going on? Yeah, he's yeah, he's yeah. listening to this, right? He's one of your yeah, fans, yeah. right? Okay, good. Of course. Uh, so, you know, I, so I decided, and I knew that I had to do something that really made me stand out. In the, in the community because you're a, you're a tr personal trainer starting in Los Angeles with no history, right? So I was thinking, do I want to work in a box gym? I didn't want to go that route because I didn't believe in those guys. I didn't know. I know that you guys started out in that in that area and maybe it would have been a better business choice in order to build a clientele, but I didn't want to go that route because my wife was already working at, it was Sports Club LA, LA at the time. 
which is now Equinox. Got it. And uh, it, it was, I knew how much money they were taking from her. Mm-hmm. And I just, I didn't want to do all the legwork and then have them take a huge chunk of that. Right. Sure. So I, I put an ad on Craigslist and I posted, hey, I'm getting a, certif- a new certification, NASM. They didn't know it was my first certification. And, uh, and I want to try, I want to practice on you. I'm going to give our sessions for 20 bucks. Nobody responded. It was crickets, mm-hmm. literally crickets. So I doubled the price. And uh, and I got people almost immediately. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah, it was just that it was a literally it's an association like value. this guy. Yeah, it was yeah. perceived value. Exactly. That was my first lesson in perceived value. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was like if what they, a great story though. That's a great lesson right yeah. there. Yeah. So yeah. I doubled my price and I started building my clientele from there. And I did all of my training outside in the park, zero overhead, and I just learned how now, to do Now is that all where the name up. Open Sky comes from? That's that exactly where it came from. Oh, okay. That's why okay. I was trying to figure out what is my what is my name going to be. It has to be something that shows what I did. I didn't work out with, even though my background was obviously was weightlifting Mm -hmm. as a kid through sports, but I, I wanted to build programs and, and workouts that were all bands, body weight, uh, medicine balls, things, shit that I can carry on my back, Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. know, in the park. And I used the hills there and the, and the stairs there. And we really utilized the entire, entire area, which was really great for the first Five years. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. It's 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 cool meeting someone like you who's prof- a, a professional That's in the good. fitness industry who mm-hmm. started later on, almost as a second career. I love yeah. asking because I've met uh, you know I've had a few trainers that have worked for me. Yeah. Um, in that same situation, I love asking them questions because I started as a kid uh, in fitness. It was like the first career I ever ever had. And uh, there's a lot of pitfalls you step into because you're a kid, you know what yeah. I mean. Yeah. But you came into a little older. Did, are, were there moments where you had kind of aha moments where you learned? things about fitness, just training others that you thought maybe were true or that, yeah. Oh yeah. I would try to take people through the stupidest shit ever. Mm. <laughs> like, you know, I think that a ton of my clients would probably get injured in the beginning because I was just trying to do things that were way too advanced, mm. you know? And I think that's what a lot of, a lot of young trainers do as well. They think that they're, they think that their clients are almost as, vin- as invincible as they are. Mm. You know, when, when they, people complain about knee pain, they just would be like, don't worry about it. You're going to be okay. Instead of like trying to follow, find an alternative movement that doesn't cause that pain or even addressing what the potential, you know, what, what their, uh, what their movement pattern is and see if they can try to break that down and see if they can solve that problem. I used to tell my trainers, uh, you don't want to be the trainer that a client calls you and says, I can't make my workout today because I hurt my back. Right. You want to be the trainer that your client calls and says, Hey, I hurt my back. Can I come see you? Right. So you can help me out. That's right. Uh, and when you provide that kind of value, um, then you become successful as a personal trainer. I think a lot of trainers and, uh, and just people in fitness in general confuse intensity, soreness, and sweating mm. with uh, effectiveness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times you're trying to show off as a young trainer, like you're trying to all the shit wow you know. them oh yeah, with all these like fancy exercises and give them a really hard workout. So it's like, oh, if you feel this, so it's working, right? Yeah. And so that's, yeah. that's the entire well, that's, thing. That's part of what's wrong with the industry and the culture that we have created for ourselves is, yeah. you know, the, the clients come in with that perspective. They're expecting that, right? Like I, I remember being a young trainer and I remember – you know, trying to program what I thought was best for the client, but then them not getting what they wanted from it, which is, I already know this exercise. Like, teach mm-hmm. me something new. Show me something yeah, different. Right. You know, and th- so, you know, at one point as a trainer, when you're coming up and you're trying to build a business, you ask yourself, like, fuck, I know what's best for this person, but then I also know what I got to do to keep them coming and make right. them, you know, so you got, you have this struggle. And I think all trainers uh, struggle with that at one point in their career. It's just a matter of how many of them actually break through and keep go and then get better and get better and get to the point yeah. where that's that's no longer a concern. Yeah, and the, I think for most trainers, their goal is to keep that client as long as possible, mm-hmm. you know, and not necessarily and not have them ever leave. So there's a lot of trainers at the gym that I work out at um, in West Hollywood, and I just one of the guys came up to me. He goes, he he's talking to me. He's like, you got to do muscle confusion. You got to really trick them up. You got to have them doing a different workout every time. And you know, and I was like, I I, I couldn't I couldn't disagree with you more. Like, I literally couldn't disagree with you more. Like, there's no way anybody's going to go through adaptation if they're doing something different every fucking time they walk in the very, room. Very, very, yeah. you know, very how, true. How are they going to get good at it if they're doing something, if they're never doing the same thing? Very true. There's there's a kind of, if you would look at uh, adaptation, you look at an exercise even, there's this bell curve of adaptation where in the beginning you see little, then you start to get good at it, then you see lots of results from that exercise or that movement or that modality, and then you start to get diminishing returns. It's at that point that you want to change the adaptation. This is why right. with our, we have programs that we sell and our programs are phased yeah. um, where you're focusing on a particular style of adaptation for anywhere between two to four weeks, depending on our program. Because right. we know as trainers, you got to do that that long to, to get the most out of it before you move on to the next one. If you change all the time. And it's got to be measurable. 
That's right. <laughs> right and you, you got to be able to measure what's working. Yeah. You know, if you change it every single time. Yeah. What do you know? Like you're just shooting it all out there. And the and right. you know the terminology that we use, you know, muscle confusion. Your muscles are stupid. They're not smart. <laughs> you don't need to confuse them. <laughs> yeah. Right. They're, yeah. they're not going to figure it out. Yeah. They're yeah. not. It's, uh, your central nervous system. You could definitely throw different things at your CNS, but right. again, you need to get good at something to be able to, to, to get that type of adaptation. So yeah. it's, I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that. What about like nutrition and stuff like that? When did you figure out like the whole protein and small meals or do you still advocate, do you still advocate that kind of stuff? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So uh, what do you, yeah. Are you stupid or? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, well, I mean, a lot of people do. Right? Really yeah. good. Um, no, we, are you, you one know, of those? My, yeah. my wife is actually a holistic nutrition counselor. So there's Excellent. been, you know, that was a big switch for me when I was, when I was just working out in New York before I came out to LA and I was just going for runs or something like that and working out with my buddies, I would stop and get a, a get a hot dog on the street on the mm-hmm. way over. You know, I would get a slice of pizza on the way over and I'd do my, do my workout, you know, with the like burping and, and, and farting the entire time, <laughs> just terrible, you know, and I thought that it was like, whatever, I'm, I'm working out. I, I don't have to worry about that. So that was my there's a whole history of like general generational eating that I that I had to deal with and, and basically unpack and then figure out why I need to change this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, just in general, if I'm going to give like an overview, obviously the most our whole entire recommendation is a whole food diet. That's everything that my wife and I stand for. We don't we don't necessarily believe that you need to supplement your you supplement your diet with anything unless it's like things like vitamin D, mm-hmm. things that you might be deficient in that you're you know naturally deficient in that you can't get from your food. Mm-hmm. But generally, most people are just they, they they're just eating shit. They're eating processed food all the time, fast food all the time, and they're just not getting in enough whole foods, whether it be veggies and meats, you mm-hmm. know, and nuts and seeds or whatever. That makes it hard for you to get sponsored by supplement companies. It makes it really, it makes it really hard to make money because <laughs> yeah. because I, I'm so middle of the road. Like I do not, I do not like we are very paleo style, but mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not paleo. I'm not a, this dogmatic paleo approach guy. We believe that you know the ketogenic diet could be very effective for some people, but it's not necessarily for everybody, and it's not also like a lifestyle that I would want to live for the rest of my life. So there's there's all these different things that you could potentially take from. Maybe Whole Thirty is a great one, but that's like a thirty day diet. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's some great <clears throat> diet programs out there, but in reality, there is no such thing as a program that's right for everybody. Mm-hmm. Right. Everybody has to figure it out yeah. on their own. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, hear that from another fitness, um, you know, podcaster because uh, it seems like we're the minority. Although, I feel like it's starting to grow. I feel like mm-hmm. people are starting to have a, a little bit of a, a different approach. I mean, it wasn't that long ago in fitness where. It was, you know, eat, you know, five small meals a day. Two or three of them are a meal replacement powder yeah. uh, or a bar. Here's all your supplements. If you're fat loss, if you're goals fat loss, if you're goals muscle building, um, your training needs to be, you know, super high intense body part split type stuff. And now you're starting to hear more people uh, speak out and say, hold on a second. This doesn't work for most people. Mm-hmm. Here's here's what the approach should be. I mean, as a trainer training clients, Every time I would try and apply those approaches to my clients, because I would do them on myself and I'd right. get away with them. Then I would apply them to my clients and it just didn't work. So I'd switch back to something else and never made the connection. I never made the connection that, wait a minute, I'm, <laughs> I'm probably a lot more like my clients than I think I am. And if I start doing those things for myself, I'll probably see better results. And mm-hmm. that's exactly what happened. So... It's it's interesting that the, the journey that you go on on your own and then it then mirrored next to like you have this juxtaposition of your client next to you because all the things that you're doing you feel like you want to teach your client mm-hmm. you know you want to and it's same thing for the podcast everything that you guys are working on on your own that's exactly what you talk about on your show so it's 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 only natural that you would try to influence your clients based on all the different things that you're learning now the problem is is that if you have clients for like eight years and then you told them something eight years ago and now you're telling them something different they're like wait whoa, whoa, whoa back up a second yeah. like you told me that I don't have have to do this. You told me that that's not a good thing to do. I'm like, well, look, you know, science fucking changes. People learn. People like adapt to like new information. So if you're not willing to adapt and try something new, then I can't, I can't really help you. Mm-hmm. But you know, I can't tell you that what we're doing right now, you know, and it's unfortunate, but you know, for certain things, but I can't tell you what, what we're doing right now is a hundred percent right mm-hmm. because I might learn something tomorrow that, that tells me that it's, it, it might be slightly wrong. You know, here's why I feel like a lot of the advice, the general advice, maybe not the specifics because that tends to change, but the more general advice, here's why I think, uh, we're on track this time. Cause it seems like in all of science, medicine and health, we're, we're kind of making this, uh, we're, it's, it's coming full circle. You know, everything started out uh, food based, then it became take these foods and extract these things, then it turned into Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. standardize these particular chemicals, then it came to pharmaceuticals and synthetics, and now it's coming back around to where we're finding like, wait a minute, uh, 
there, you know, we co-evolved with food. Uh, we co-evolved with bacteria. We co-evolved with our environment. And because of that evolutionary process took so long, it probably is best for us to mimic some of those foods and, and yeah. eat those natural things. Yeah. And there's a lot of it that we don't understand, but we're finding that it just... It just it's just better. What we do you, tend to be healthier. What do you guys think is the is the kind of impetus for that? What do you think created that turn? I have a theory on it. I'm curious. Turn to for see. the bad or turn for the good? Turn for the good in terms of like us thinking about evolutionary eating, how we you know how we progress. You know, well, I think I think the pendulum has swung just like we saw with cigarettes. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, just 20 years ago. You weren't cool if you weren't smoking. I mean, just 20, 30 years ago, you could- I was smoking 20 years ago. Right? I mean, 20 years ago, yeah. people were smoking. Everybody was smoking cigarettes, and it was a cool thing to do. And fuck, your doctor would take a smoke break between his patients, you know? Right. My cousins like, were delivered by a doctor that was smoking while he delivered. Right. So, <laughs> true. True so what we have seen, and, and cigarettes still exist. On their head. They still exist. They yeah. haven't gone away. It's crazy that they right. do. Right. And people still smoke them, and they, and they will never stop, right? Probably because of the addictive properties, whatever. But the point is- it has gotten to a point, though, now where you could be somewhere and be like, oh, my God, she's smoking. Gross. You know, when people are grossed out by it. So we have seen the, the pendulum swing one way and it's coming back the well, other. It's the information age. Well, and what has is happened you're to, yeah. is people. Yeah, we know now. We know like we're, we're not oblivious to what it's done. Now, we were marketed to 20 years ago that it was, even when they kind of knew it was bad, that, oh, it's still kind of good. So we were confused right. or enough information now has came out where, OK, we know it's fucking bad. Well. We're going through that right now with food is there's still some people that are pushing back that are still blinded by the advertising and marketing bullshit or PhDs that are giving bad information still out there. Yeah. But there are more good. You can fact check them now. Yeah. There's more good, brilliant minds coming forward. And that was a lot of what inspired Mind Mm -hmm. Pump was Mm -hmm. to be part of that movement of helping catapult some of these names. Because what we found was, man, I would meet people in the industry that are just, they're huge. And I'd be so excited to meet them. They're all the huge following. All, and then we start to, you listen to the information that they're giving and you're just like, fuck, it's terrible. <laughs> then I have a guy who's a brilliant mind that nobody knows who the fuck he is. Yeah, yeah. Giving, ha, that's teaching me all kinds of things, things I never knew and I should have known as a trainer and a health professional years ago. And I'm learning so much. I'm thinking like, how the fuck does not more people yeah. get to hear this information? And like just because, followers. because they're not sexy. Yeah. They're not sexy. They're not, they're not. They don't take their shirts off in their, in their yes, pictures. Yes, and yeah. they're not marketable. You know, they're right. brilliant. They spent all their time in books and, and labs and learning. And, and so, yeah. That tide is turning, and we and I think it's because it swung so far, and now we're seeing all these autoimmune issues and shit going on, and we we can't put our finger on exactly where it's coming from. Everything's starting to lead back to it's probably what we're eating. Yeah. I, it's yeah. if, in my in my opinion, it just takes time. I mean, anytime mm-hmm. we solve one problem, this is what we do. This is our history, history of humans. We'll solve a problem with uh, something that then becomes a problem itself because mm. the solution then becomes that, look, antibiotics, right? Yeah. We discover uh, antibiotics. We won the war against bacteria and germs and the overprescription of antibiotics um, in everything, everything from hand soap to you know cow feed to even the antibiotics we take, now we're starting to see the repercussions of that, the unintended right. like we uh, side need, effects. We need bacteria in our body. We, yeah. we not only need bacteria, but if we just obliterate it uh, all the time, we, are, we can create uh, pandemics and epidemics. We're, we're a ticking, a tipping, ticking time bomb mm-hmm. at the moment from something that we created. Um, I just think, look, x-rays, when x-rays got uh, uh, you know, discovered and used, you know, I don't know if you guys knew this, but podiatrists used x-rays in, when they'd sell shoes. You would go in to buy uh, you know, a, piece of, a pair of tennis shoes or whatever, and they'd x-ray your foot and be like, oh, it fits perfectly. That Your kid would go in there, put the shoe on, because they didn't really? know the date. Absolutely true. Yeah, That's absolutely gnarly. true. Some of the first <laughs> x-rays used uh, commercially were used in uh, uh, places that sold uh, shoes, shoes to kids in particular. Uh, but we didn't understand it, and then we started learning some of the, the, some, some of the negative effects. With food, we solved hunger. We really did. In the modern world, in modern societies, Western right. societies, we don't starve. We right. used to all the time. We don't really get malnourished either. I mean, I know we talk about people who have deficiencies and we're not healthy, but it's we don't see people with rickets and scurvy and all these other well, sometimes disorders. You do. Yeah, you'll see some people like that are just eating gas station food that right. haven't had any nutrients and, and they do yeah, but, still have cases of scurvy and rickets. You do, but it's so it's rare but, yeah, compared it's like it's, to it's, how it's, it's a poor it, and nobody's going hungry. Yeah. Nobody's going it's hungry. It's just that they're misinformed. Like they are, are uninformed, I should say. Like it, uneducated. And we and we solved that, right? We solved yeah. that problem. But the way we solved it 
was with uh, mass-produced, um, heavily processed, long-shelf-life food. Mm-hmm. Um, we, and because we're, we live in a market-based society, which has got great pluses, there's also some potential negatives. And one of them is that you're always going to follow the consumer. And the consumer just wants something that tastes good. And so the engineering, which we've always done, we, you know, humans, have, ever since we started cooking food, we've engineered meals to make them more palatable. It's just modern technology really took that to the next level. Yeah. And now you've got foods that have flavors in them mm-hmm. that would never exist in nature. And we're mass producing them and you can buy them anywhere and they're super cheap. And you've got problems like obesity, diabetes, mm-hmm. autoimmune diseases that are creeping up. And it just took time. It's taken really the ob- obesity epidemic didn't really start to take off until the 1970s probably and uh so that's a good you know four or five generate uh, four or five decades and now you're going to start to see i think you're starting to see the turnaround the turnaround yeah. in fact i know soda sales have dropped i know fast yeah. food sales are starting to drop for well the we first solved time. all those problems right we solved yeah. all those problems of like hunger and uh you know the immediate needs and so now it becomes this whole plethora of new problems that we've created and you know with the internet creating all this like information this vastness of information now that we can access um it now it's like we question everything now yeah. like let's question the common thought process of like okay you know how did we get back how did we get in shape back in the day and what were the methods that everybody was using and and then kind of peer into that process a little bit more bring that back to surface and and, and dissect what was good what was bad and i feel like just the thought process of that alone has created uh, a lot of people to get interested back into you know either old or methods that you know were overlooked the, in, in it, again like uh, if we look at like the industrial revolution when that really started taking off like nothing we built could be uh, bad. It was like at the time, and I love reading about history because we tend to repeat some of the same mistakes. But at the time, uh, it was, I mean, it was, it was incredible. Like here's the industrial revolution. We're building machines that are doing things that we could never do before. Every you know month, every newspaper that came out was this new advancement with these new technologies when they yeah. were using for steam power and then coal technology and you know the, the the engine and all these. It was incredible. And then they built the Titanic. The Titanic, unsinkable. It was like a it was a marvel of modern technology. And uh, at that end, and it went down. <laughs> yes. And 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 people started saying, "Hold on a second, maybe we don't have all the answers." Mm-hmm. And I think that's starting to happen now with. You know, when I was a kid, you go to the doctor and they, whatever they said was gospel. People are now starting to question things. I think we've seen enough times now where things get reversed, where they say, yeah. here, do this or take this or this is perfectly safe. Yeah. And then 10 years later, like, oops, you know, it gives you cancer. Yeah, I have a client right now. That she's uh, she's 87 years old and she she doesn't sleep. She can't sleep. She sleeps maybe one or two hours a night. <laughs> and her husband was a, uh, a, a GP. I, I don't know. He might even specialize in something else. But I, I told her, you might want to try uh, talking to a naturopath or an osteopath or a holistic doctor or somebody that might be able to try something new because the doctor that she goes to gives her uh, pills, sleeping yeah. pills. Okay. And she's this woman, she walks around like a zombie all day long. You see it like just her eyes. I just feel so bad for her because she has – her brain function is so minimal now. Her – physically, she's just deteriorating and she is not taking any other alternative uh, routes to figure out how to solve this problem. Mm. And it's so frustrating and I try to – I said, hey, do you, want me to, do you want me to introduce you to anybody? Because I've interviewed a bunch of different naturopaths and osteopaths and you know holistic doctors and just alternative doctors on my show and – the, the, her, her husband said that they're quacks. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, this generation is starting to change a little bit. Yeah, it, it's. I think. I mean, she's eighty-seven, so yeah. obviously she's still she part of that other generation, right? Yeah. Uh, be, well, I mean, back then the doctors were it. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. especially yeah. if you're around here. I mean, I'm sure if you were another, you know, if you maybe Eastern, you know, uh, like you were in uh, in China or other countries with long histories of different types of medicine, but. In America, like the the history of medicine was pretty bad up until it, you know modern medicine started kind of taking over. Yeah, you said you had a theory as to why you. Oh think yeah, it's so to come so I, I think I mean I think that well obviously the internet is a big thing, but I think the internet can be very uh, overwhelming for a lot of people. It's just like it's it's a fire hose of information mm-hmm. when you search anything. Mm-hmm. I think that I, you know, and I tie it back to obvi- I think podcasting is one big one. 
I think that people can choose their source, and if you stay, if you stick with one specific person, you know, like Mind Pump or Open Sky Fitness Podcast, like if you stick with one person, you can really gather a lot of information from different avenues and have it filter through the brain of those people who seem to be really wanting to make a change, not just for themselves, but for their audience and their and their clients. But I think it's interesting because I think that Paleo was a big uh, a big needle mover in that, and I think the thing that brought paleo to the to the table was the crossfit world and it's 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 like if there's anything that crossfit did bring to us it was really it was almost it was paleo because it was just like vhs versus beta or blu-ray versus um versus what was the high def right Mm -hmm. porn industry decided both of those Mm -hmm. but you know but i think but crossfit decided paleo paleo versus the zone diet and paleo really just took over and now we have this now we're all thinking about things in a more of an evolutionary standpoint Mm. we didn't think about it like that before we really didn't we didn't think about nutrition from like i think i heard you mention on a show recently but i i talk about this all the time whenever somebody says do you think i should do you think well it was you know do you think the american heart association recently did that that study right that 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 they mentioned on usa today about coconut the oil. about the coconut oil right? right and does it seem does it when they recommend corn oil and soybean oil over coconut oil does that seem right i mean just from an, just from like a natural standpoint you can literally squeeze a coconut with like a lemon press and get oil out of it you can't do that with corn and soy Mm-mm. it makes no sense that that like from mother nature wouldn't provide what we needed to be healthy right so if we're it, it just if we think about really- it we start to think about things from an evolutionary standpoint were we able to get our hands on this now obviously food and and all that stuff has changed over the over the decades and the and the and the and the, and the centuries but you know were we able to get our hands on these foods generations ago and for a lot of the crap that we're eating now we don't but they're touted as being healthy mm-hmm. as being heart healthy or a good a better option which is saddening to me. And it, the same approach can be made uh, with exercise, the evolutionary uh, right. model um, where you know, we look at specific forms of exercise and we know, we know how to train for particular types of performance. But we also know that the more specialized you get with your training, the more extreme it becomes with its goal, whether it's extreme endurance or extreme strength even, yeah. which are on both sides of the spectrum, they both have their problems because they're both so extreme and evolutionarily speaking we probably did all of it we probably Mm -hmm. lifted heavy shit when we needed to that's right we definitely walked and maybe ran for long distances when we needed to omnivores Uh, omni exercisers yeah exactly (laughs) come up with a name exactly and and when you approach fitness that way you find uh your body seems to work best uh at it the the big thing with fitness that i think needs to change that we talk about all time and i don't know how it's going to change is this, uh, it's so centrally focused on um, appearance and the cosmetic mm. that it really makes the right, it makes it difficult to deliver the right information. And the irony of that is um, when you start to train, for most people now, of course, I'm not talking about extreme, like if you're bodybuilding or you're, but for most people, if they went from a health standpoint and wellness standpoint, they would actually look the way they're trying to look yeah. while they're training specifically for right. just appearance. It'd be a byproduct. It would. Be, mm-hmm. It's a side effect. Yeah, it's an absolute side effect. So, right. and you were talking about that. You're talking about how training people can be difficult sometimes. Yeah, because it, it, of that. It's true because I, well, I live in L.A. You know, yeah. it's the it's this is that is the mecca, the epicenter of of vanity. Mm. So people don't train there because they want to get healthy. They train there because mm. they want to look a certain way. Mm-hmm. And if you can't provide that to them, they're going to find somebody else who can. There's lots of trainers in Los Angeles who are going to give you steroids if you ask mm. for it. There's lots of trainers in LA that are going to tell you to like to to, to, lots to cut of out cosmetic surgeons. Yeah, yeah. yeah, lots of cosmetic. I have. I mean, it's ridiculous. I have clients uh, multiple who ask me about about liposuction or something like that, and it's just for like like little things, like just want yeah. to get rid of that little extra th- something. I have a trainer that walked up to me the other day and says, "My client's asking me about." getting lipo back here and he knows that I do a podcast and he knows I do a lot of interviews so he, he kind of comes to me with like random questions like that and he's like what do you think a liposuction for behind the arm I was like great she'll never have fat behind her arms again but it'll go somewhere else because she's not going to fucking change anything about her diet this woman just wants a quick fix you know I got a story about that yeah. I, had, I had a client years ago who uh, came to me and we did an assessment and then she wanted a body fat yeah, test we've all had these dude yeah and, yeah and I'm testing her and I'm doing the you know the the, the classic you know the, the points the bicep <laughs> tricep subscapular I see whatever. where this is going and I'm testing her and I test her bicep and and for those of you who aren't trainers uh, every time you test someone's arm bicep and tricep the tricep is going to measure higher it's just we store more body fat back there especially if you're a, if you're a woman I've mm-hmm. never encountered a person 
where the fat the measurement neck when you uh, wave, right? Yeah. yeah. Where the fat measurement on the bicep is higher than the tricep. And if anything, except for this lady. and if anything, the, at most they're close. Right? They're close, yeah, but it's, it's like not a, like it's like a seven and a five or something. Yeah. Right. So I test her, and she was, you know, she wanted to lose about forty pounds, so she was overweight. So I test her bicep. Her bicep was like five times higher in measurement for body fat than the back of your, her arm. Yeah. And I kind of knew that when I looked at her because it just something didn't look right look about weird. her arm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I tested her, and then right away I said, "Have you had liposuction on the back of your arm?" She thought I was a wizard. <laughs> <laughs> she looked at me like, what? How, How do you, you know guess? that? And yeah. so of course I play it up and I'm like, well, you know, I've been doing this for so long. I can tell <laughs> I can tell things about the body that we need to work on or whatever. But no, it's like, listen. You should be in a carnival fair or yeah. something. I tested yeah. you. Your bicep's fat and your tricep isn't. That's weird. Sorry. You're right. You walk out with like a stuffed animal. You're yeah. like, you know, I, I don't think, I, and I think that's such, it's actually a good story because I think we've all probably had multiple clients with this. I remember the first time I encountered it when I was really young, man. First client that ever went and decided they were going to do that. And she went and did lipo tummy tuck whatever and she ended up gaining the 60 plus pounds back and now it just put on a, a weirder shape like yeah. she looked <laughs> yeah. she looked better it's like spongebob yeah, yeah. She, yeah. Looked, she, looked, she was like normal fat yeah exactly yeah you, you then you get like this oddly fat Weird. after that so yeah. if you don't change Patchy if fat. you don't change the root cause of of how you got fat right yeah. or that how you got to that point if you don't change that it's going to come back and now it's going to yeah. come back disproportionate. Yeah. <laughs> so, I had a guy I had a guy who he was when I got when I finally got to him he was all he was all like uh sutured up like he had all the scars because he had had he had liposuction and then he had to have all the skin removed because he was like 350 pounds mm -hmm. when he when he was coming down. But he didn't change his diet, and I tried to talk to him about diet, but he just wanted to do the workouts, and it was it was it was a complete kind of like mental fuck to try to train this guy, and mm. and but he kept he he didn't gain any weight when we were working together. He actually lost a few pounds, which was fine, but all of his weight was in his legs and his ass. He he literally looked like he had like a woman's body. Mm. It was all down like he he didn't gain it in his belly at mm. all. He had a flat belly, which is really odd when you see a guy that's slightly overweight and it's all in his ass. People don't that's <laughs> I, you know this is a great topic because with liposuction. Oh, we reached it. You, you <laughs> say, yeah. Yeah. No, you got to realize you got to realize like uh you, of course people store body fat and you know you can get fatter and most people want to be leaner. Yeah. But there is a male way of storing body fat and there's a female way of storing uh, storing body fat for the most part. Every once in a while you'll see, you know, outliers, but for the most part men will store it around their midsection or you know the, the, their love handles. Women store it in their lower body, their thighs, back of their arms and their mm -hmm. breasts. And if you gain weight and you're a woman and you change that or you're a man and you change that, you're better off not you, because then it not only now are you heavier but just something just doesn't look right. There was another right. guy at a gym that I managed, and uh, I talked to him about it. Actually, I actually asked him about it, and luckily he was he was cool to, to talk about it. But he came in; he was a you know lean guy working out, and then he started gaining weight, and he gained weight, and it was all in his chest, neck, and upper body. Yeah. So he looked very strange. He had this fat like neck and face kind of area, and was like I, the, the Incredibles. It was it was. And it, <laughs> yeah. And I remember thinking, like, is he on like some kind of weird medication? Or I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So There's I, I, something here. I yeah. went and talked to him about it, and he told me, no, he got all the fat from his midsection removed. So then when he went and gained it, it he stored it in this kind of strange. You, you know, know you got to do. You got to. You got to. You got to get lipo in every part of your body except right. for where your muscles would be. Yeah. So you just look like so you have like these tremendous biceps and this like right. this chest that sticks out, but it's just all fat. So yeah. you just so you have to strategically place your liposuction. Yeah, exactly. I think that would be the smartest thing to do. Oh, man. Yeah. So what's uh, what are some of the wiggle, what weird. are some of the like the things that you did as early on as a trainer that you look back and go what the hell was I doing? Oh, uh, well, like just you got to rat yourself out here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I think taking through taking people through like plyometric moves, power mm -hmm. moves or way early. You know, people that didn't have the stability to do stuff like that was probably my biggest my biggest mistake. Um, I and I and I you know some of the people um you know I, I don't I I hope that they didn't have like you know lifelong injuries, but some of the people <laughs> would get would get injured. Obviously, I mean because you're just doing stupid shit. Yeah. And it's, you know, this is all over TV. I mean, that's every infomercial. Oh my you God. see them doing plyometrics to fucking hell, right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. So I would do things like that all the time. And, uh, and, I, but only because I think we try to, uh, early on when you're a personal trainer, you try to have people do what you're doing. Right. It's the only thing you know. The only thing you know is what you do. Yeah. And then you try to kind of, uh, you know, relay that over to the people that want to learn. Well, you know, then you realize, wow, people can't even do a squat without their legs caving in. When I learned that, that was like, I, c I couldn't believe it. 
I couldn't believe how that lack of just somebody couldn't just sit down as if there was a chair behind them. Mm-hmm. You know, no, 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 just get your ass back, start to sit back, don't let your knees crowd in. What you know, and they, their feet would cra- cave out, their knees would cave in, and they just and they would just like go down as if their back was sliding along a wall. Mm-hmm. It's like, what is the matter with you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I just, I just do it just like I did it. Yeah, it's no, like yeah. I'm literally showing Why? you how to sit down. Like just imagine there's a couch right behind you. Just sit. Actually, you know what? Here's the ball. Just sit back. You just slide down the fucking wall like, like some weird <laughs> shit. <laughs> It's like they're like, you know, like a matrix thing or something. It was really weird. The first time those are probably some of the first time you see that happen and you and you realize that as a trainer. And then when you realize that that becomes the majority. Yeah. Like, holy shit. Then there's the the anomaly here. Right. And then there's the asshole trainers who load that on someone's back. You know, you see that all the time. There's I mean, even at even at my gym, which is a one. It's just an exclusive one on one gym. There's I, 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 I get really kind of sad for that client because that they're going to hurt themselves maybe not today but it's coming they all those all those patterns are there they're they're all out of alignment and they and their trainers just locking it in now do you think with that, weight on do you think trainers should have a better screening process with the certifications and stuff because i mean we've all seen that there's a, there's a lot of trainers that are just horrible there's great ones too yeah but there's quite a few that are bad i mean the problem is i think you should uh, i think most people the way they get their trainers by referral mm-hmm. so i think that for most people you should definitely talk to the people that have had that person as a trainer and don't go to someone who you know, uh, who's hasn't, cause look, even a shitty trainer can have somebody lose a hundred pounds. I was a shitty trainer when I first started and my client lost a hundred pounds. Doesn't mean that I can't help them, Good but point. I, right. So it's like, so I had to, I had to learn that process, but you want to find people that you look at and you go, okay, that person moves really well. And then they also have a trainer and you could, I, the best thing to do is go on your social media, ask for people to make a recommendation and see if they have trainers in your area and then test them. Go out and try that trainer out. If you're, I always give a first session for free because I know that the guy's going to stay with me. Mm-hmm. I, I have no doubt that they're going to train with me for the first time, and then they're going to be like, "Okay, when do we start?" Yeah. Mm-hmm. A big red flag is if you go to a trainer and the first time they don't even do an assessment. You, right, you'd be surprised how many people right. show up and the first time they go to a trainer, the trainer takes them right through a workout. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like you don't even take them through like some kind of squat assessment or any, and just to, just to see how they move, just right. to see how they walk, yeah. if there's any kind of misalignment. It'd be like taking your car to the, to the mechanic and he goes, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! Don't tell me." <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna fix your car. <laughs> you know we need to do donuts. Yeah. Someone yeah. first. Someone rip out this engine. Yeah. Let's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's get this thing going. I just need a yeah. smog. I don't know why you guys. <laughs> Dude, I gotta ask you. Being in LA, like yeah. it, with all these like celebrities and being you yeah. know in in the sort of haven for all this stuff, like yeah. what what's the craziest sort of fad you you've seen coming in that you've had to like you know describe like why it's so stupid to your client. Oh, oh my God. I get the, I mean, especially early on in the podcast, I always get those questions all the time. And that's a really fucking tough question because there's just so much shit out yeah. there. Um, um, I they think all that, started there too. I think yeah. like yeah. the HCG diet started like there. The M theory or whatever. What I was that a, one we read about? Oh, you just eat mushrooms? Yeah, you just eat mushrooms, <laughs> the magical mushrooms. Yeah. No, no, no. It wasn't those no, mushrooms. That wasn't magical mushrooms. Because that might actually yeah. work. Right. I had a client on the, on a show that was doing the HCG diet with, and it's it's just a low calorie. I mean, you're- 500 calories 500 calories, ridiculous calories. And the guy dropped all this weight, but- and he's going to this doctor, obviously, but uh, that was, I mean, that's that's some of the craziest shit. These low calorie, I have another client that dropped, she dropped like 60 pounds on another 800 calorie diet where the doctor was giving her these, I don't even know what they were. They look like these brown kind of chalky uh, pieces of uh, cracker that she was supposed to eat as her like carbohydrate source for and fiber source. It was disgusting. Uh, and, and, and bouillon cubes. That was what the, you would get every meal delivery. You would get this like electrolyte. You know, you know what? Like it, it looked like uh, it looked like molecules. shredded wheat, but burnt and oh and flattened out like a, like the size oh of a gram, the like size of a gram cracker, and two bouillon cubes. You know, you know why you lose weight on that diet? <laughs> <laughs> because it's yeah. fucking gross. Yeah, you know exactly. what I'm saying? <laughs> no, hey, she, yeah. hey, listen. Here's yeah, I'm not I got the, Hey, check this out. I got this yeah. diet. Uh, <laughs> basically, you can eat as much as you want of these foods right, right here. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Bouillon cubes <laughs> and fucking and wood pulp. Crackers, yeah. mm. but you can eat them as much yeah. as you want. Yeah. Yeah. Go to town. Go to Stuff town. Yourself. That's it. I, you know, That's it. I only eat two of those a day. They're fucking gross. Yeah. I've lost hundred pounds. I can't figure it out. <laughs> Shit like that is, is stuff that we see all the time. There, um, there's you know, you guys did a podcast episode about. There's a, I think it was the first episode that I heard of yours uh, because uh, Josh was on the show and he posted it and I was like, oh cool. And then I was scrolling through your episodes. Oh cool. 
And I hope it wasn't one of our first. No, it wasn't. It was, no, it was the. Yeah. It was your Beach Body. It was the oh, Beach yeah, Body yeah. one that uh, you had talked about. Uh, not Beach Body. Sorry. Uh, Baywatch. Baywatch. Baywatch mm. workout. Zach Efron. Right, right, right. Zach Efron. I, 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 that guy trains in my gym. No. Yeah. No joke. And I was just like, I had to listen to it because I had to. Do me a favor. About it. I want you to go up to him and be like, Hey, they did a whole episode hey, about you on my yeah. I didn't know. Like, I don't want to. Like, I look. No, I'll, I'll tell you this. I don't want to be a total dick to the guy because it's not like. Yeah. Exactly. But I'll tell you this right now. Like, I, I, I. I chit chatted with him a little bit because he uh, he ended up moving to that gym right after uh, Zac Efron was on Baywatch so mm. I, or that movie. So I don't know exactly what his workout programming was. But he wrote what he did was after that, he knew that he was going to be BuzzFeed was going to be doing this article about sure. it. BuzzFeed came to him and said, hey, we want to do an article about a Zach's workout. Can you mm-hmm. tell us what he did? Put something and, together. And he's yeah. like he and it was actually really smart on his part. He goes, look, I'll take you through it. He was he looked at the guy. He judged him and he goes, this guy's just like 20 pounds overweight. He plays ball. The, the, the writer of this article of this blog said he looks at him and he just goes, he's a baller. He works out. He plays basketball like five days a week. He works out three days a week lifting. But he his nutrition is shit. Mm -hmm. So basically what he did was he gave him like a really simple workout, changed his nutrition, and the guy got ripped. I mean, in two months, in eight weeks, he got pretty ripped. But he would have gotten ripped like that if he had just (laughs) stopped eating fucking Panda Express, which is like his favorite food if you read that that blog post. But he was smart on his point because then he knew BuzzFeed was coming out with this. And I think you guys read his – you were referring to his workout program. I think it might have been in bodybuilding.com or something like that. But he sold – a workout program, a, a Baywatch workout program, and he sold. Don't tell me at like he sold like, like sixty thousand of them. Shut the fuck <laughs> up right now. Of yeah, he it's did. like it was. He like sold ridiculous. sixty thousand. No, no, not sixty thousand. Sorry, he sold in the first in the sorry sixty thousand dollars worth in the first week. Oh yeah, I still. That's true. Yeah. God damn it. For a hundred, they were one hundred and fifty dollars a piece. So you do the math. But that BuzzFeed, that BuzzFeed article got over his his landing page got over a million hits. Wow. Hmm. But only X amount of people bought it. If you do the math, I count. See, guys, if we were if we were in LA, we'd Doug be can fucking, figure this out. Probably, we'd be crushing yeah. in LA right <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah. Train yeah. some celebrity and then seriously. But you know, I think that you're 100 percent right because yeah. I've I've uh, I've interviewed Gunnar Peterson. Do you guys know who that mm-hmm. is? Mm-hmm. Right. So I interviewed him on my show, and and it's it's interesting because it's a totally different philosophy on training. You walk into Gunnar Peterson's gym. Have you ever? No. Do you guys know him personally? Mm-mm, okay, no. so we could shit talk. No, I'm yeah, just yeah. kidding. We're not gonna <laughs> do that. But like you know, he if you walk into his gym, it's toys. It's nothing but wall to wall toys. Mm-hmm. Everything is orange and yellow. That's his. That's his company num- com- colors. Everything gets painted orange and yellow before it enters the place. And he has like you. There's one walkway. You guys have that green uh, astroturf out yeah. there. He has that small thing, maybe three feet wide, going down the entire run of his of his studio. And everything else is machines, mm-hmm. machines and toys. And the, his philosophy. I trained with him, so I interviewed him on my show, and I trained with him. Every Friday for like maybe two or three months. And he's an interesting guy. He's very alpha male. Uh, not kind of, not like my kind of guy. Like, mm-hmm. I, you know, he's just, he's very opinionated. Uh, and I guess he can afford to be, you know, he's, he's, he, he's a <laughs> he's, celebrity trainer. He's a celebrity he's trainer. He's Stallone's trainer. He's the Kardashian's trainer. He's like, he trains, like he has his facility. You literally, he has a parking lot just for his facility and it's just for his clients. Right. And there's only one or two clients that work out in that 4,000 square feet facility and that's it. Just those two people. I don't think he makes any money on his on his facility because he's just gonna even if it's two fifty an hour or three hundred dollars an hour, you still got to pay a twenty thousand dollar or thirty thousand dollar nut every month. He just, just needs a that. brick and mortar location for for whatever his whatever yeah. else is he's he's promoting. But the, the thing that he told me in that process was that look, you know, these people want to know that everything that you're giving them is the best, is the newest, is the most up to date, is like all of that information. That's what people want. So when they get there and they're playing with these toys. Just like we were talking about, like keeping it interesting for your clients. That's what it's about in Los Angeles. It's about keeping it as interesting for your clients as possible. Mm, they're all and about novelty down there. Huh? They're all about novelty. Hey, you ever worked out on this fucking machine? No, I've never even heard of that thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You never yeah. heard of it because only my <laughs> trainers right, got it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they gym. love that shit. They want the new. They want the car that no one has. They want yeah. the shirt that no one that has. They want the sense. shoes that, want, that no one has. They want the trainer that has the machines that nobody fucking has. Yeah. Wow, that's Los Angeles. That's now you know what? That's been happening for a little while in LA. I wonder if you can go in there now and open up. Like a just a like a cement floor, like rusted weights, yeah, like and, yeah. kettlebells and old right, dump, like, old like barbells, Mark Bell, like what those guys have up yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, you know, a couple rings and just be like, yeah, I'm, I'm taking it back to the old school. <laughs> and it's like gymnasium, you know, on, <laughs> the, on the front. Basically, yeah. that's CrossFit, but you can't get away with that. If like one, if like if if an individual client walked into like if I had my gym and it looked like a, a CrossFit box, the client would walk in there and go, what the. 
fuck is this? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like I'm out of here. Shower. Dude. Yeah. yeah where, where's the shower? Yeah. Yeah. Where's I'm the where's here. the where's the where's the hammer strength machine? You yeah. know, like they would they want all those things. So they don't they wouldn't. It, I mean, I, I don't know. I think you can make it cool. You know what I mean? I think, <laughs> I, think, I think that's what in your, in your head, head. That's what yeah. you well, want. Your head. Not you know in what? L.A. This I walk into your I, I walk into your facility here, and this is the facility that I would create. Like I yeah. actually, I had a graphic designer, a friend of mine, a girl who was in my boot camp when I was doing that back in the day, and she would do all of my graphic design for free. She designed my logo, she designed mm. my T-shirts, all that kind of shit. She was awesome, and so I had her design my gym because my idea was Open Sky Fitness. I was going to have the, my gym was going to be a garage, an abandoned garage that was like this l-shaped garage on the corner of the on the corner of a uh, uh, of the street you know mm-hmm. and the outside was going to be all astroturf and then inside we would keep all the machines and it would be there would be bleachers on one side like it was a football stadium we'd run bleachers it would be like this cool outdoor indoor yeah. kind of feel i like it but you know and and sled poles and, and and pushes and shit like that and and then you know my wife does gyrotonic so we would have a section for gyrotonic i don't know if you guys are familiar with that i don't even know what that is yeah, well, yeah gyrotonic yeah gyrotonic is like a cross between pilates and yoga and it's um it's all machine based. There's mm-hmm. gyrotonic and there's gyrokinesis. Gyrokinesis is like Matt Pilates, what Pilates is. Mm-hmm. And then gyrotonic is like, you know how Pilates, they have that reformer? Right. So gyrotonic has, they have the reformer, but gyrotonic has five different machines. Oh, okay. Interesting. They have, you got to look it up. It's actually, it looks like this torture device thing. It's all now, Has it been around a while or is it something new? Mm-hmm. It's They've been actually... around, it's been around for no, for like probably 15, 20 years. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. And it's been, I'm you know. I'm surprised I've never heard. Okay. Interesting. Well, I could tell you why it's not, nobody has ever heard of it. It's because the guy, Julian, who owns it, he's in Germany. He has such a short leash on everybody that becomes a gyrotonic instructor. You mm. cannot post videos. You're not allowed to. Really? It's trademarked. You cannot post videos and interesting and marketing strategy. <laughs> it, really, it really is. But it, it's only, if you go, it's only in major cities. Or maybe, you might be able to find one here in San Jose. You might be able to find, you'll find a couple in San Francisco, obviously. Carmel, like very wealthy areas oh, will see. have them where people have enough money. Uh, to he get certified, to keep it exclusive. To get certified costs $10,000. Mm. Okay. Just to get started. And the way that my wife found it was she was dancing with uh, the Graham Company. I don't know if you guys are in the dance world at all, but Graham Company is one of the uh, premier. Dancer. Yeah. I, I can tell. Yeah. By, just by the way you move. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the, the Graham Company was probably one of the premier um, modern dance companies in New York. In the world, mm-hmm. I should say. And that's what they did. Gyrotonic is what they did in the off-season to stay limber, strong, lean. Interesting. Yeah, and that's how she fell in love with well, it. Well, that's smart. She got since. into that, especially yeah. like being the novelty of, you know, in LA, that's like it's such yeah. a hook for that community, yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. But it's hard to it's hard to branch out. Like, you've never yeah. heard of it. Right. You no. know, you guys have never heard of Gyrotonic, and now maybe with your, you know, with your millions and millions of listeners that you guys <laughs> do have, you know, that's, now everybody's going to hear a little bit about it, but like we Shaq... pissed off the owner. See, what I would like, do is I'd get <laughs> certified, I'd learn it, and then I'd do something a little different, and then do my YouTube videos, and... <laughs> you know but yeah, they would, they would, they would, they would sue that they would sue the yeah. shit out of you. It's really yeah. fucking weird. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. 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 Good luck, man. Post it on YouTube. That shit goes viral. Yeah. So I you, win. Yeah. So so your podcast was uh after your gym. Did you original or after your became a trainer? Right. Did you start the podcast to promote your business basically is that why it's the same name well originally i wanted to do youtube and my buddy oh. who's who's also a filmmaker he worked for how i met your mother which i was mentioning to you guys earlier uh he worked for how i met your mother and i said he's a great you know videographer and you know i guess that's not what you call them dp whatever the fuck mm-hmm. you like a video director or whatever so he's uh his name's alec left give him a shout out just in okay. case uh but he uh i asked him i said would you be willing to do my youtube videos because he had helped me i auditioned for some workout video tv show or something like that and he helped me shoot that video I said, hey, man, would you help me make YouTube videos and just create content? Because I, it's like one of the best ways to drive traffic. He goes, you know what? It's a, it's a pain in the ass to do videos. Let's, I have all the podcasting equipment. Let's do that, and we'll create our, we'll create our uh, content that way, and we'll partner up and do it. So he was working at How I Met Your Mother at Fox Studios. I went there with him, my buddy Jeff Meacham was also the co-host of my show. And we started that together like Car Talk for Fitness. I love how you guys are the Howard Stearns of fitness, yeah. right? But that was, we were Car Talk for Fitness. So we were guys that were just like trying to solve, people would call and we would try to solve their problems. Mm. But logistically, Doug, let me ask you this question. If, if you have a podcast like this and you have to have three different people call in and everybody in the room be in the room at the live, same time, yeah. call in live and ask questions, mm. logistically, that's the biggest pain in the ass. I can oh, only yeah. imagine. Yeah, I don't it's, know about it's that. It's ridiculous. Well, we've done one-offs before just by letting somebody who's like, like gone through like the maps program because we actually talked about doing this on a regular and it's a headache 
mistake just to do it with one person calling yeah. in. So I can't imagine. Oh yeah, I mean most of my stuff. If it, you know, uh, where I'm not, my podcast is not as big as yours. So, but I do get some really great names on my show, which is which is pretty awesome. And I and I and I really I know that I have a good show. I know that I do a, a really good interview. Mm -hmm. So I have a I I I have that, but I can't get Mark Sisson to come to my house. I can't get you know mm -hmm. Dr. Perlmutter to come to my house. You know, or people that are you know in New York or wherever flying in. So I can't do that. But I do get some. I do get some great people do come to my house and I can I can really run that but otherwise it's it's really hard to kind of reach the masses. Wow so you wanted to do this you wanted to start at YouTube and four years ago when you started the podcast yeah so you were hold on a second I'm not gonna I don't want to crap you out here go ahead I'm going to I'm about to shit all I'm about to crap you out had you started YouTube four years ago I would have killed holy shit yeah because like uh like the fitness people on YouTube that's Michael Ching do you guys remember when you found out about YouTube oh it was like 2006 yeah my buddy goes hey man you could see any episode of any TV show on this new thing called YouTube and I'm like what the fuck are you talking about yeah. everything that you could ever want to watch is on yeah. there yeah. and I was just like what the f I don't get it man yeah. I just don't get it well I mean everybody who did fitness on YouTube when it kind of first started taking off like yeah. five years ago even they're all massive now just yeah, because yeah. they were the only ones. Like, yeah. what's his name? Six Pack Abs, dude. Who Mike Chang. God yeah, yeah, yeah. damn, yeah. idiot. Like, hey, that was longer, though. That, those guys, they, yeah, they were on there ten, longer. You, this is 10 years. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. definitely, they, we're talking 2006, 2007. Mm -hmm. Like, that's when that's when YouTube really just started rolling. Mm -hmm. I was way after the game. Like, I was thinking, I wasn't, I was no pioneer who was like, you know what? YouTube. You know, I was no pioneer. Mm -hmm. I was the guy who was. You'd already to, seen like, guys like him. Guys make, were doing make it, it and I was trying to figure out how to kind of, how to, how to mirror that. Yeah. 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 But still. Still would have been a good Are you decision. doing it right now? Are you messing with you much? <laughs> no, at all? I'm, I mean, I'm potentially going to be repurposing some Facebook Live videos. One of the things that we do on our show is we we, we try to keep our audience really intimate, right? And and so what we do is we we offer a Facebook group. Do you guys have, you have a Facebook group, but we it's do. only for people who are doing maps. Is that right? No, it's a, we have a forum that people enroll in and it doesn't matter what you're following. Now, a lot of them do follow maps, but Got it's it. a fitness forum so they can ask questions. We have a lot of trainers, doctors, you know, yeah. we're on there. We create, Got it started off literally the three of us with two people yeah and we fostered this community where and we all get on there so we're at, very active on it yeah. and so what's neat is that when we first were on it we were on it a lot and we were helping all three five ten fifteen people that were on there they were able to do videos of themselves squatting over in india over here in florida over wherever yeah. and we could critique their squat we could give them coaching tips and it and it really and I, Sal was probably the best at this for sure. This is his baby in the business. Uh, he's continued to foster that community to the point where now we have these incredible doctors, PTs, personal trainers that are in that community answering and now, questions. Now they're all now they're yeah. just naturally helping. Each now other. you guys are a little more hands off. You don't have to be in there because there are people that just as knowledgeable, Sal's still if not in, more. Sal's still in there fucking multiple mm -hmm. times a day. Sometimes Sal's yeah. taking a dump. Yeah, he's yeah, just, yeah, he's, he's you know. that's how you know doing I'm, the Lord's work. That, that's how you know I'm pooping. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so <laughs> he's on the floor. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So yeah. He, yeah. he does. Sal's you know, answering. You're very regular. You know what I was just thinking three times a day, and and I don't know I don't know how much you're. Your, your listeners or fans would appreciate this. I know ours do because we actually do talk about business and, um, you know, this is kind of a unique uh, opportunity that we can get in this. We openly are okay discussing. We share a lot of our, our personal business and how we make money and what we're doing with our audience. So, you know, if you want to go that direction where we talk about some of those things, like we're open to t discussing that shit. Yeah, I mean, I I would love to because you know that's if you're if you are an online entrepreneur, somebody who's trying to make a business, uh, you know, out of something online, whatever it is, it's such a it, it can be. It can be a very daunting task. Mm -hmm. There's so many different aspects of it that are uh, overwhelming, especially for a guy like me. Now I know you guys have a team, which is great, and that's really smart. I maybe I'm a little more of a, a like a solo patron uh, or whatever mm -hmm. the fuck you call it, right? <laughs> I'm just like I'm I'm all I'm, I'm usually by myself, and maybe that's not a good thing. But uh, yes, it's it's really interesting to me to find out how people do it and how they structure it. You know, because the Open Sky Fitness podcast, going kind of back to the earlier question, was like I started it because I wanted to create content I wanted to have a connection to, to an audience mm -hmm. and for the longest time I didn't even try to I was giving away free like downloads but you know and doing some kind of lead generation through that but I'd also have um, I'd also you know be doing like I started creating landing pages and all that crap and that was probably for the first you know year or two and then I was like this is I don't have a real connection because you could send out email blasts, but the, the response, the open rate's usually like anywhere from 20 to 25%. And then the actual people who click on things is even lower than mm -hmm. that. So really the people that are interacting with you through your email list is minimal. So I knew that I needed to open up something new, which is one of the reasons why I started the Open Sky Fitness podcast group. And that is an amazing community because now... 
which I think, and you guys can maybe chime in on this, is when you know, when you can have a direct access to your audience, then you can ask them what they want. Mm -hmm. Until then, you're just kind of, you know, taking shots in the dark. You're hoping to God that maybe what you're doing is is what these people are going to want to buy or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's going to, that's been my first like step. And I'm trying to now. So how long have you had the group for? Uh, almost a year. Almost a year. Almost Excellent. a year. And are are you letting it get to a certain size? Uh, or well, I mean, I'm grow? I'm trying to. Grow, I mean, obviously, I would love to grow it as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, right now, we do have a a really great. We have it about five fifty. So it's it's not. I mean, you, I think free, you guys. Are, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. mine's free. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's totally free to get into it. Uh, it's about you know. I think you guys have. Uh, I'm in one of your forums. I, okay. I, I think there's only like t- around two thousand people in there. That must be like the that. private forum, right? Yeah, yeah that's the private forum. Gotcha. Oh, I don't know you're on there. Cool. Yeah. I well, I I actually I requested to join. And then I think it was Katrina or somebody said, uh, did you buy in? And I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. I just, I just, I saw this was a mind pump forum and I just, cause I come in, I'm coming on the show and I want to see what people are talking uh, about. Uh, uh. And then she's like, oh, Sal said, it's cool. You could come in. So like, and then I was <laughs> in. So now I was, I'm in that forum, but you know, yeah, you get all the dirt on us now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's right. That's I, where Justin I backdoor my way in. That's where he posts all his nude pics. <laughs> I know. I yeah. save it for the privates. Yeah. So we weren't yeah. kidding when you said you do porn. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I wasn't. <laughs> so, so I'm trying, I mean, so I'm at the very early early stages and and you know um this is tough because it is my wife is on the show with me but i uh, but i'm you know uh and not trying to take anything away from her. like i i'm all of this is self-generated mm-hmm. like all the information that we're trying to put out we every single week we're trying to figure out what people want to know and we asked our audience what do you guys want to know and we we dive in we don't know everything i think that any podcast or any like uh any professional that tells you that they know all the answers they got their head so far up their ass they don't know which way's up mm-hmm. you know so we do we dig in we start doing the research based on a lot of the philosophies that we've learned over time mm-hmm. and that's basically our 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 kind of um our focus but we haven't yet figured out like the big like you guys have maps right Mm -hmm. you guys have I don't know how, how many programs is it all together. Do you know? We have uh, quite a few. We have Maps Anabolic Aesthetic. We have Performance. Uh, we have Prime Prime Pro, which is coming out. Maps Anywhere. anywhere yeah. and I think that's all of them, right? Did yeah, I name so them all? Six. That's six. And then yeah. we also have guides. We have a Fasting Nutrition Guide. Um, yeah. We have a uh, Blood Occlusion Training Guide. Um, and what other? Oh, the No BS Six Pack Formula. That's a core workout program that I came up with a long time ago. Um, so we've got quite a few things. The thing about um, trying to make a living out of fitness. Uh, besides the brick and mortar way, which would be either owning a gym or working in a gym or working, you know, as a trainer, is to sell supplements. Unfortunately, that's the big yeah. that's the big way to do it. Uh, but based on your philosophy on nutrition, it'd be difficult for you to do that because you've that's already right. talked so much about and you've you've you know you would I fuck you, myself. You well, yeah. <laughs> we we talk about this all the time. You could. <laughs> And, and, I mean, you, you, not say, to- you can we, say it out loud. Literally, use the you're same words. You're not yeah. totally. You're not Don't totally fucked yeah. because we, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's harder for us. No. Let's put it that yeah. way. It's a lot yeah. harder for guys like us that are going this route. Um, yeah. But we also agree it's a longer road. but yeah. it's, it's worth it. it here's the, here's the thing. When we started Mind Pump, we looked at the because we had so much experience in the industry. I mean, I've I've been a professional in fitness for 20 years, and I've been a, a fan of fitness for even longer. Of like really, really deep. And we started seeing some trends. When we first started Mind Pump, we had this conversation. We were actually in Adam's living room, and we were talking about the direction of the fitness industry. And I had brought up a point where I said, you know, you know, four years ago, if you went into Safeway, uh, there wasn't an organic section. Mm-hmm. And now there is. Actually, it's in every grocery store. If you look at the, the, the market and the way it's shifting, you're starting to see uh, the big companies like Coca-Cola purchase these organic kind of healthy companies because they're hedging their bets because, and that's what you want to do. When you look at the market, it's always a good idea to look at the big players because they spend all the money trying to predict what's about to happen. And usually where they start to invest is a pretty good indicator of where the market's going to go. And we'd also seen this as trainers. And one thing that we realized that was sorely lacking in fitness, sorely lacking, and it's starting to come up a little bit, uh, is the lack of integrity. There's Mm. just no, there was no integrity in fitness. People would sell anything uh, to make a dollar, and yeah. uh, the 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 real solid good advice just wasn't coming out because it wasn't making anybody money. But like all markets, at some point you get a backlash, and all the 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 three of us sat down and we predicted it. We said, look, social media is it's like uh, it's like air, and that air is going to wash out all the bullshit. It's 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 like sunlight coming through because with social media, it's harder to be fake. Uh, the photoshoppers shoppers and the, the bullshit before and afters are going to start getting 
called yeah, out, which we them out. Yeah. which yeah. we're seeing now. We've seen it already. Yeah. Um, you know, people are now the supplement market has been big enough, long enough to where people are starting to say, wait a minute, this is kind of bullshit. There's all these reports coming out of these independent companies coming in testing supplements and finding they actually have nothing. You know, there's a huge percentage of them that have nothing in them, uh, like what the label says, or even some have like toxic things in them. Um, and we saw this and we said, okay. Uh, and, and not to mention, uh, you, we were we just were integrity based people. Like we couldn't bullshit anyway. Even if you tried, even if we tried to really lie and bullshit, right. the truth is going to come out because that's just how we talk. So we knew this. We sat down. We said, okay, we're going to hedge our. We're going to we're going to bet that the market's going to take this big change in direction. We're going to try and spearhead it. We're going to be honest. We're going to have lots of integrity. We're so honest. We're going to be raw about it, and we're not going to make any money uh, in the beginning because no one's going to want to pay us since we're going to speak you know, poorly about all these products. But once we build an audience, once you have an audience, then you can start to figure it out. Yeah. And that's exactly what we did. We started Mind Pump and for an entire year, we didn't sell a single thing. Well, and let's talk about that, how important that piece right there, because this is the, I think, where most people make a mistake is they get so hung up on how they're going to make money that they don't spend the real time in building the community. Mm. Building the community is everything. If you don't have the right message, you don't have more than five people uh, listening to you or giving two shits about what you have to say. Uh, I don't give a fuck how great your product is or how great your idea is. It ain't gonna, You're not going to make any real money off of it. You're certainly not going to make a living off of it. So I think a lot of people I see that try and create online businesses, they get so caught up in you know how I'm going to make this much money and I need to do this. They assume that. there'll be a demand there. When yeah. They haven't yeah. even yeah, vetted that yet or even gone through like, oh, what what is my audience? What does it look like? Right. And, here, yeah. and this is some full disclosure on a current uh, – thing that we're going through right now. We just had this topic. In fact, you can see it on our whiteboard right now, the July focus. And the July focus for us is to work back in the business. We've gotten so caught up in all the moving parts in this business and oh, growing this and flying here and doing that. It's like, man, when was the last time we worked in the business and really what we th did the things that we had to do to grow it to this point. Mm. And so everything that we're creating and we're building this month is giving back to our audience, nothing in return, not making any money. How do we enhance this process for those that are already in our community now? And for those in the future that are going to be coming into the community. And I think just not enough uh, entrepreneurs have that mindset. They're so focused on how they're going to make money and how the next guy is doing it and trying to mimic what they're doing versus like, do you have a message that anyone gives two shits about? It's like that quote, right? Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm. And, you know, when our, our, focus on that piece of the business first, then then the, the other part, and you said it really well, which I think is a smart place for you right now, which is you're building this private forum and community. That's a perfect place to ask those people what they need, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's what we do. And actually I post, I post like uh, a poll in there that asks, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, I'm asking like, what is the, what is the major thing that you're struggling with right now? You know, what are you, what are, what are your obstacles? If you were, if you were to, uh, if you, if you were to put a finger on the, the one thing that you really are struggling with, that's holding you back from achieving whatever it is, the, 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 the body weight that you want to be, the physical, the physical, the level of physical, uh, fitness that you want to reach. What is that thing that's holding you back? And they give you all the answers. I mean, they literally do. Like, I'll name, like, maybe I'll say, uh, maybe my problem is, uh, I, I'm not motivated. Maybe my problem is lack of knowledge. Maybe my problem is this. And then they'll fill in. They'll just, like, fill in that poll. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I follow up. Great. Okay, guys, look, the, the, the top two ones where you had no willpower, you had no, you had no, la you, had, you felt like you had a lack of knowledge. Okay, let's break this down a little more. If you feel like you have a lack of knowledge, is that about nutrition? Is that about your fitness? Is that about, like, how to time manage? Is it, like, what is it? And then they start to, and then you can really start narrowing down those things. The thing that, the thing that uh, I think I struggle with business wise is well for one doing too many fucking things I, I do I do way too much trying to manage everything but um, is not necessarily picking the one thing that is going to be the biggest needle mover and you know one of the things that I really love to do, over the last 10 years, I love working one-on-one -on -one with people. That's a, that's a big thing for me. Not necessarily one-on-one -on -one with, you know, like with, you know, building up my clients. I, you know, I've, I, I've done that. I'm fine with that. Like if, if I wanted to live that lifestyle for the rest of my life, I could train clients until I'm 65 years old. I know guys that do that. That seems like that would totally suck. But, you know, if I wanted to, I could, and I could probably do fine. But, you know, what I want to do is I want to have, I want to reach a broader spectrum. I want to reach people that, so the way that I look at it is like, I'm, I'm the in-between between, between a guy that's sitting on the couch that's 300 pounds and then the guy who starts doing the MAPS program. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I want to be the in-between. 
I want to be the guy who gets you off the couch, gets you to just take a fucking walk around the block every day, gets you to do it like drinking enough water every single day, gets you actually eating some vegetables and, and, and potentially helping you kind of wean off of all the sugar and all the things, processed food that's in your diet. I want to be that guy and then they can go and move on to something a little more advanced if they choose to. Well, you're talking about the most important um, aspect of, of fitness, which is uh, the psychological piece. Yeah. It's not, it's not even close the you know the information piece information is very important right. yes but the psychology behind it uh is far more important as uh, i mean be, uh, training as many people as i have uh i was uh i would be very successful when i understood that part when mm-hmm. i when i was focused on more on what we're doing and how we're eating and that's it i was not nearly as successful once i really figured out the psychological piece then i had clients who never worked out before would hire me and would train with me for 10 years, 12 yeah. years, and now I don't train them anymore. I still stay in contact with them, and guess what they're still doing? They're still working out, and I was able to make those those right. massive changes. One of the big shifts for me in that realm was really understanding uh, that it wasn't about hitting a target um, because fitness is so uh, – it's so – it's so focused on goals, on a specific goal. Lose 30 pounds, gain 20 pounds on my bench press, run faster, you know, uh, build my biceps, whatever, that we forget that really, if you really want to be successful in fitness, you have to do it consistently. That means you got to do it all the time and you got to do it for long periods of time. It has to become a part of your life. Mm-hmm. And the only way that's going to happen is when you stop when you stop focusing on the fact that it's not about goals, it's about enjoying the process. That's really about it. Right. It's about the process. Once you seek out the process, yeah. every day I seek out my workout. Every day I seek out foods that feel good to eat. Yeah. I've made those connections. Now, like, what are goals? Like, I, I lose the weight. It just happens. I build the muscle. It just right. happens. It's about enjoying uh, that process. And when you look yeah. at uh, studies on populations of people that live very long, where you see lots of centurions, this is exactly what they do. It's just, you know, the, the, the old man that's 110 years old, uh, the reason why he's lived so long isn't because his goal was to lose 30 pounds and, and get stronger. It's because every day I walk up that hill over there that I really I do that every morning mm-hmm. and I milk this goat or whatever and then I go down to the beach and I go fishing for a little bit and then I meet with my family and we have this you know this meal from the garden and it's just what I do every day and I love it. Yeah, like that's the that's really the key. Yeah, and I I don't I you can definitely make that impact on people one on one. But you know, like you, uh, you know, we we share that sentiment. We want to be able to to share that to a lot of people, make a big impact. Really, the audience we love talking to the most are other trainers. We like talking to other trainers because if we can influence those trainers, we know that Spread they're going to influence. Message. Absolutely, yeah, because yeah, well, it's just absolutely. mushrooms out from there. The you know, I have on my wall right behind my computer. It says the process is the result. And I and I say it on my show probably every maybe every third episode. I just I just remind everybody you have to be in on this process because if you're not focusing on the process, then you're just then you're and you're only focusing on the goal. Then you're you're missing the entire point. And there's also I did a, a, an episode specifically about goals versus intentions. And there's a really there's a really good example I use. It's like you can have the goal to get to the top of the hill, go for that hike that day to get to the top of the hill, right? That's your goal. And it's it, very clear. It's easy to see, you know. But if your intention is to uh, also experience life as as it's happening, you know, stopping and smelling the roses, stopping and actually maybe having a conversation on that hike, uh, then that's a life to live, right? If your intention is to enjoy the process, then that makes getting to the goal that much more enjoyable. But if, you're, if your only thing, if your only thing to focus on is that getting to the hot, top of the hill and you put the blinders on, you are going to be a miserable person, mm-hmm. right? miserable person inside and out. And you're not going to be any fun to be around with your friends. And you're not going to be any fun to be around with your family. And you're going to, you're basically going to eventually hate yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's just, that's just the reality of it. Yeah. We have a, a horrible um, success rate in fitness. It's very, very bad. People don't stick to it. Um, we're not solving uh, the health problems. Like Overall, like you guys should. aren't talking about yourself. No, no, I'm talking about... <laughs> like, confession time here. Trans- our group full transparency. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, yeah. I'm talking about just the fitness industry just does a very... We, and I, we, I say we because we're part of it. Yeah. Um, we don't do a good job. I mean, yeah. uh, we have not been the answer to the obesity and diabetes epidemic. We have not been the answer to... Um, you know, any of the ailments that we're starting to get, uh, the, the penetration into the market... You know, fitness has penetrated more and more the market, but it has not made um, a substantial uh, difference. Yeah. Um, people uh, view exercise 
in the wrong way and nutrition uh, in the wrong way. And um, we hope to change that. We really hope to make it something that, I mean, how great would it be if that was a part of the culture? You know what I mean? Well, it, I mean, I think it I think it slowly is. I think you said that earlier. I think it's starting to really be ingrained, especially this millennial d- generation. These fuckers don't like they won't eat anything that's not organic, not whole food. Like there's some of them that do, you know, they 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 do kind of fall off track, but I mean, some of the most obsessed people about their health <laughs> yeah. are the millennials. Yeah. It's a, but it's great. Yeah. I mean, it's it's so cool because they're getting so technical about how they solve their problems and they're mm. becoming so scientific. They break it down. Like that's the that's the you got to you got to look at yourself as like being a little scientist and you are that 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 uh, you know that test subject mm-hmm. and you test it out and one on yourself you are that person that is going to and and people are doing that now which is so fucking mm-hmm. cool That's the now most you can positive take, uh, millennial reference I've heard. <laughs> yeah. right besides Ever. the fact that they're total yeah. assholes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, wow yeah, but, all right yeah. oh sorry yeah Jordy's uh, happy we got Jordy yeah. over there yeah. but you know it's I think it's I think it's I think it's true and I think that they're uh, you know they they are that next generation so it's it, we are losing that you know my parents. Uh, not good, you know. Not my dad's had multiple heart attacks, multiple strokes, mm-hmm. lung cancer. Uh, he's got a hard time getting around. My grandmother's got dementia. You know, my my mom basically has chronic pain in her back and, and sciatic down her leg, and I can't help them. Mm-hmm. They, you know, I try. I, it's one of the reasons probably I do what I do because I just felt like I could not get through to them. You know, and and they don't look at me as the expert. They look at me as the son. Mm-hmm. You know, so I give them information, and and they just they just go, oh okay. They probably and think I, you're weird, right? When you go over to eat dinner, and you know, no, mom, I can't have that. Oh, yeah. you're on that special diet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, well, it's funny because we, that. like I said, we eat mostly paleo. Just and what I mean by that is, I'm not. We're not hardcore paleo, but we're it's mostly meat and vegetables, and that's mm-hmm. basically our diet. We don't have chips in the house. We don't have you know like all that crap bread mm-hmm. in the house and stuff like that. That's just not what we do. And so my parents came and visited me uh, for about a week and I said look I'm cooking for you guys I love to cook it's one of my things I'm a huge cook I, I, I love it and uh, I said I'm cooking for you guys every night I'll cook dinner for you guys but you know we're not serving bread we're not serving pasta we're not doing that stuff I said you're gonna eat fine you're never gonna be hungry you're gonna the food's gonna be delicious but they left after two days <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where they went uh, no but they by the by the end my my dad's mental clarity was significantly better his energy levels were significantly better by the end of the, the vacation they said I can't believe how good we feel <laughs> like they didn't feel like they went on vacation they felt like they went to a spa isn't that crazy that it blows people's minds yeah and then you tell them like what do you think yeah. like this is what you, you you eat food every day it literally becomes a part of you, yeah. of mm-hmm. course it's going to have an impact on yeah. how you feel. Yeah, exactly. So they went home and they. she's like, my mom's like, what was I eating? Tell me what I was eating. I just want to know what should I be doing? I was like, mom, it's really simple. Just focus on eating meats. Don't even worry about what kinds of meat. Just focus on meats and fish and and and, and vegetables. And you know, if you want to have some starchy vegetables in there, potatoes and stuff, that's totally fine. Just don't make it starchy vegetables and meat. Mm-hmm. Just you know, like have a pretty like half of that plate's green. Mm-hmm. You know. And so they did that for like a couple of months, and they felt really good. And then they started slipping back into their <laughs> habits. Shit. Yeah. You know, it's like you can't really not that you can't teach an old dog new trips, but as long as you're make not making it. Like you said, if it's not a part of the process, right? They were. Well, my mom was looking for the result. This is yeah. this is also later. with what we talk about where we try and connect people and getting more connected with their their relationship with food, mm-hmm. their relationship with exercise, and their relationship with themselves. And a part of that process is actually learning to accept and understand that there's a lot of things that have been imprinted in us since we were five, six, seven years old. Like, yeah, I mean. I definitely have a, a sweet tooth and it wasn't like it, it didn't just come out of nowhere. Well, no, I was able to eat fucking cereal my whole life, ice cream before bed every night. Right. I mean, I did that for 20 something years of my life. So, and even now that's not something at all that's ever in my freezer. But I tell you what, if I introduce it into my life real quick, you want it. Yeah, I want it. And it's not, and you know, we got into a little debate uh, with a buddy of ours about the the science behind the addiction part of this, but you can't deny the behavioral addiction that happens. So maybe it's not something chemically I'm addicted to and we haven't got the science to for sure prove exactly that. But I'll tell you right now, there's a behavioral part that 100% I'm addicted to because for 20 something years, I allowed that to be in my diet and I'm sure my brain's connected to good times, uh, have, having a good oh, time. Oh, come on. You, 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 for sure, people make connections to food 
based on when they were kids for oh, sure. Like yeah. I can't go by just if, smells. If I smell yeah. McDonald's, McDonald's yeah. is a shitty burger. Let's be honest. Like it's just it's not no, a it's good burger. Depends of what time of the day but, and how early it is in the morning. Uh, right. <laughs> but if I smell it, I get fond memories because yeah. when I was a kid, I'd go to work with my dad. My dad does. He's a you know blue collar worker, and I'd help him when I was you know 11, 12, 13 every summer. And he'd get me McDonald's. Uh, that was my thing. That was like the way he would kind of say thank you to me. And I loved it. So I have this like great association with McDonald's and hanging out with my dad and having this great time. So when I smell it, I'm like, oh, man, I want McDonald's. Yeah. If I'd never been exposed to McDonald's and I went and ate a burger from there, it's shit. It's not yeah, a good yeah. burger, yeah, but I've got yeah, that yeah. association. Right. I actually had uh, – it's funny you talk about this, Adam, because this happened to me literally last night. I'm at my mom's house. So my family, old school uh, Sicilians. I'm a first-generation American. And in, in our culture, especially in my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation, one of the ways that you show uh, love to people is you feed them. But you don't just feed them. You feed the fuck out of them. Like, <laughs> you stuff them. You stuff them. You stuff, you yeah. stuff, and that's literally how we manja, show. Manja, manja. Come yeah, on. And that's how we show love, and especially to children. So if, you're, if you have a child in this culture, in that generation, you – the more you love them, the more you feed them. And you're feeding them all the time, especially your grandmother. My grandmother would follow us around the house with food. <laughs> I'm not even making this up. This is a true story. She would follow us around with food and would just keep just sneaking it in, in your mouth while you're playing or something. Like her job, you her goal, her, her goal was to distract you. I'm not yeah. even making this up. Distract you with an activity. Yeah, shove something in your mouth. Yeah, like, come on, eat this. No, I don't want any. No, no, no I'm full. Oh, I don't want any. Come on. And then she'd say, come on. No, 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 I'm full. I'm full. Oh, look at this. Play with this. Look at this. Then you play with it. And then while you're playing, like mindlessly, she'd sneak the food, the food right in your mouth. And you eat it. So I met at my parents' house last night. How are you not 300 pounds? Dude, uh. a lot of people in my family. <laughs> So I'm at my I'm at my mom's house last night and I got my kids there and as an adult I'm becoming more aware of some of the ways I'm connected to food and exercise and it's in phases mm -hmm. and one of the last phases or one of the last or the newest ones that I'm going through right now is because I have kids is I'm realizing uh, how I pressure them to eat food and how I you know if they don't eat I'm not loving them and I need to feed them and. You know, I'm starting to understand. I'm starting to become aware of this whole thing. So we're at my mom's house. We're, we're eating dinner. And, you know, my son doesn't want to eat all of his pasta. So he's sitting there. He doesn't want it anymore. He's like, I'm full. And so my mom's like, no, you have to eat it. I'm, but I'm full. You can't go on your computer then if you can't eat it. And it's back and forth with him and his grandma. And I'm sitting there. And now that I'm more aware, in the past, I'd hear this and I'd be like, oh, this is great. My mom's going to get him to eat because she's a she's gangster at that, right? She's going to get him to eat. This is good. Now I'm listening to this. I'm like, holy fuck. Like, she is totally developing this poor relationship to food with my son mm -hmm. like it's it's really bad so i'm talking to her and i'm speaking to her in sicilian so my son doesn't understand i'm telling him i said listen ma i said he doesn't want anymore don't let him eat anymore oh he, he barely ate anything i said i understand that but he won't starve like well then he can't play his, his computer she's telling me this in sicilian i said mom it's not and then my dad chimes in and my dad's like he goes sal he goes he goes, he goes, let your mom do this. She's really good at this. She'll get him to eat. <laughs> That's it. That's like, it's almost like he thought, he's thinking I'm telling my mom to not do this because I'm telling you, her, yeah, you're trying to do, do it. Because yeah. I'm telling my mom, like, Ma, it's okay. Like, don't, don't, don't worry yourself. He thinks I'm like, and he's convincing me, like, no, 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 son, your mom's really good at this. Let her, let her do her thing. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. So she's like, no, you have to eat half then. And she starts bargaining with him. And I'm watching this. I'm like, oh my God, like, this is really fucked up. Like, what you know, and, but she, but she loves my kids so much, yeah. and this is how she shows love to the point where I finally said, "No, he's not going to eat anymore." And I told my son in English, I said, "You can, you can go play. Don't worry about it." And she was angry with me, and I had to have a talk with her. And she's like, wow. "Your kid didn't eat enough. He's going to be, you know, this." I said, "Mom, listen," and I'm trying to explain this to her so she becomes more aware of what's going. My grandmother used to time us. We would sit there at dinner, and if we weren't eating fast enough, she'd set a timer and be like, okay, the first person to finish gets like a quarter or some shit, and we'd fucking stuff our faces. <laughs> you can't tell me that that isn't going to influence yeah, right. your eating habits yeah. Yeah. as an adult. It's why It becomes wired into you. So Especially at that, that age. Yeah, I got, I got a good example of that too. But it's not only, it's not only like the experiences, because that was a total experience that, you're, that your son was going through and you were going through with the, you know, with the timer. <laughs> That's fucked up. But, um, but it's like, it's that experience. But then there's also the food, the genera generational food that's being served. That's part of your community, right? If you're, if you're, if you're Italian or Sicilian, you know, I grew up, my grandmother was, was, uh, is 100% Italian. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom is half Yugoslavian, half 
Italian food was huge in our house. And every every Sunday we would have uh, spaghetti and meatballs or you know some kind of pasta dish. And then every Friday night during Lent you would have pizza, right? It's it's very it's just you, you kind of follow those patterns. And it was meat and potatoes and bread on the table at, for basically every single meal. People don't realize the reason why Italians eat so much pasta and bread is because they're they need to know it. like Italy was a poor country yeah. when these foods were introduced. It was a very poor country and it's very cheap. Yeah. You can make pasta very cheap. You can grow lots of, you know, you can make semolina, make your pasta, grow, mm-hmm. make your bread. And Italians, because Italy is a peninsula in the Mediterranean, surrounded by, you know, in some of the best weather to grow vegetables and fruits and whatever, they got very, and there's fish, right? Because they're in the middle of the ocean. They've got, they, they just were very, very creative with this really cheap food. And so you've got all these varieties of pasta, whatever. And so people think, oh, pasta is so healthy. It's not. It's just, it was a cheap food that they adopted real quick. That's right. But it's not a Mediterranean, it's not part of the Mediterranean cuisine, or at least the, yeah. the traditional Mediterranean cuisine. I remember my grandma, grandmother telling me stories about bruschetta, right? So, yeah. which is just it's sliced pieces of Italian bread with, you know, like tomatoes, tomatoes, and, tomatoes and, and onions and, you know, and parsley or something. I mean, and basil and parsley. Whatever. Yeah, olive oil, right? And she's like, this was peasant food. This is what you would do with your with your with the with the the stale bread, and now they're serving <laughs> this as an appetizer when you go to an Italian place. Why do you guys think it's hard oh, bread? Yeah, because yeah. yeah. that's a stale, yeah, stale it's just bread. A piece of stale oh, bread. Man. Exactly. Now Mind they blown. toast it and they make it like a little more presentable. And they but, looked around like, what do we yeah. have? Fuck, we're hungry. Scrape yeah. the mold off real well, quick. Yeah. <laughs> well, we got these. Uh, we got the stale bread. Yeah, and you know tomatoes grow everywhere. Yeah, I got it. Let's make a dish of and tomatoes. When, and yeah, bread. and when you're making meatballs, <laughs> they're, they're, I mean, yeah, a binding agent is breadcrumbs. But my grandmother, I remember my grandmother would just take all of the bread and just keep it in like this one space let it, in go a stale, right? let it go stale and she would just grind it up into breadcrumbs that was what we she used for her for her meatballs creative you know yeah. it's not creative it's just the way they did it it was yeah. just like they left they just kept all they didn't waste anything well that's it yeah they didn't waste anything so one of the example kind of going back to your <laughs> you know your, your example of like how your parents fuck you up uh is the is i remember eating like pasta spaghetti and meatballs all that stuff sitting at the table and my mother would be eating grilled chicken and and, and broccoli and so she was always on a diet. Mm. And so for me, I, you know, the way that I interpreted that was you only eat healthy if you're fat. Mm-hmm. You only eat like that if you have a problem, mm. you know? And so go, getting older, I was just, and she wasn't making me eat that stuff. She wasn't getting mad at me for not eating food. It was just, I was, that's my experience of that moment of watching my mom eat chicken and broccoli, um, you know, turkey burgers and, and, and this bland lettuce and stuff. And I was like, wow, man, that sucks. I mean, I don't want to ever be overweight, (laughs) you know? And that's, that's how I experienced what healthy was. And so when I tried to start getting healthy, that's kind of what I started to do in the beginning until I learned better. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, we learn a lot of this as kids and then in our culture, it's a, a, of course, just like you're saying, like eating healthy is for when you're out of shape or overweight. Yeah. Eating healthy is not like, that's not just the way people eat. You know, when people go, to, when you go to a restaurant with people and you hear someone ordering, you know, at times people would, at, would, when I'd order food, they'd be like, what are you on a diet or something? Or, you know, <laughs> yeah. what are you trying to do? You're trying to get cut right now? Or, yeah. like, well, no, I actually enjoy, that's just the way I eat. I enjoy eating that way. And until we're able to make that change, I don't know. We'll see what happens. I mean, I, I, I do see what you're saying with the millennials and it, there does seem to be a trend reversing, but then I also see shit like... <laughs> You know, um, you bash on millennials now. Well, no, no. Then I then I see shit like yeah, you know, let's like bring it home. like like yes, organic food sales have gone through the roof, but so have organic candy sales. That's you know true. what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, or I look at you yeah. know, I, I'm I'm looking at these treats and stuff, and it's like non-GMO cookies. Like, yeah. oh shit, let's get some yeah, of those. There's a girl. There's a girl that sells cookies. She's a trainer at my gym, which is kind of fucking hilarious. But she sells cookies, and they're all like, they're all um, gluten-free, non-GMO, gluten-free, non-GMO, yeah. all this stuff. And she comes and she's she's and I go, are you serious? You're putting these out? She goes, well, they're just the leftovers from when I you know I sold a whole bunch of these. And she goes, my clients think they're healthy. And she's like, they're stupid as fuck. Dude. <laughs> oh, my God. That's horrible. They're stupid as fuck. They just like, they think that they're healthy just because it's like organic sugar, okay, organic cane sugar, non-GMO. You know, that's horrible. What is the matter my with My clients people? are dumb. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're such idiots. Well, you know it's become a selling point when, you know, I bought a, a bottle of water not that long ago, and I think I took a picture of it. I almost, I think I posted it even on my Instagram page. Like n- it's, non-gluten. It said, it water. said gluten-free. Yeah. All no way. Water. It did not. Yes. I saw one with salsa. It said gluten-free. I was <laughs> yeah. Like, Fuck you. Yeah. Well, they put like they put like fat-free on on potato. I mean, on well, that's uh, on pretzels fat-free. and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, like just it's like why would there be fat in there? You know, it's just yeah. like they're, they're, they just put it on there so people who are on a diet think I can Ooh. have that. Yeah. yeah. Licorice. This one's that. on the list. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the, the licorice. What are they? Called? Called the you know you red like vines it. red vines red vines still says it a fat free food fat free yeah. oh, I love it <laughs> it's healthy a good, 
it's, it's the, fat free right now in this moment in its form, but you know yeah. it's gonna be yeah like, right right so vegan red you'll ropes. get there you'll get there. So yeah. do you have any ideas uh, that you're throwing around in terms of how you're gonna grow your your business my and monetize business? it? Yeah, yeah, you know uh, some of the things that that I'm doing now is uh, and I've been talking about this on my show is my wife and I are getting into doing more one on one online coaching. Mm-hmm. I find that you know I did I did like a test run a couple of months ago on this and I had a really great results in terms of getting through like when you work as a personal trainer with your with you know and you you're at the gym and you you say you work out with your per, your personal trainer 3 days a week right that's average mm-hmm. how much talking do you do about nutrition about lifestyle about you know about you know the things that you're struggling with psychologically sure. none i mean basically you guys just chit chat about the shit you're talking about right. you don't want to open up in a gym Mm-hmm. Because you, most people feel self conscious, so that's the things we talk about. So we'll work one on one with people, and really get to the heart of what the problem is. You know, like just that that example of gener- generational eating. The way I associate healthy food, that's 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 really visceral for me. That mm-hmm. that makes a lot of sense yeah. for me. And there are a lot of discoveries along the way. Like I've had clients whose like parents have like died in their arms because of heart attacks, mm-hmm. and they are just like, they don't want to go down that road, but they also have an entire lifetime of only processed food, mm-hmm. and they don't know anything different. So to talk to them about like how processed food process, go, you know is digested in your body, how it affects you, how it affects your weight, you know that is just that, if we're talking about the lack of knowledge, people don't even know how to make that leap yeah. from how that food makes me feel, how that food you know makes me digest, how that emotionally I feel, mentally I feel, physically. I feel well one of the most common things I hear from people when I tell them things like okay uh, I want you to avoid uh, we're not gonna eat any uh, any processed food and then they'll be like what am I gonna eat yeah they're totally lost almost like they ran out of food yeah. like yeah. Oh, I'm gonna starve I can't eat anything it's like no there's yeah. a lot you're of like food you can eat or yeah, this, so yeah. that's I think the difference I think the difference between what I do and maybe what like a lot of trainers would do is I never tell people what they can't eat I never take anything away. So you tell them to aim for things rather well, than avoid. So, things. like a, a really good example would be: first, we're setting up our. We, we want to know where we're going, right? Because we're. I usually work with people for three months. You know, if we're talking about online, and then we might extend it longer than that, and then we might do more like monthly check-ins, mm-hmm. right? That's the kind of that's the that's the model that I'm building. Uh, whether or not that's sustainable and a smart move, I don't know yet. But it's going to give me the opportunity to really learn throughout this process, like what works for people, what doesn't work that for people. That for sure, you'll get that from that. Right. For sure. So one of the things like day one, uh, I want them to know what they're eating. So I want them to write down what they're eating. That's a huge thing for a lot of people is they don't even know what they're putting in their body and they don't know like, uh, yeah, I had diarrhea this morning, but you know, I don't know. I always have diarrhea. So what's the difference? It's mm-hmm. like, well, no, now if we know what you're eating, we can kind of track that and see why, you know, what's, what's happening there. So sometimes that'll be like one of the first things. It's like, can you write down everything that you're eating and just tell me when you're eating it and then give me all your energy levels along the way. I want to know what your energy levels are, what your hunger levels are. And then, so then I get it like a real inside snapshot of what their life is like. And then we start incorporating things like drinking 80 to hundred ounces of water a day, just getting into the fucking habit of drinking water. Most people don't drink water. Most people are drinking sweet teas or, or like sweetened coffees or whatever it is. Now I'm not telling them not to drink their coffee, mm-hmm. not telling them not to drink their tea, but good luck fitting in like, you know, a whole entire gallon of iced tea or Coca-Cola or, you know, or a jug of coffee when you have to get down that much water. Mm -hmm. Right. And if they say, well, that's really going to be difficult. And what the fuck are we working together for? If I'm the only thing that I'm asking you to do is drink 80 ounces of water. And that's like half of one of those things or not even a gallon of water. Right. It's it's it, it should be that should be a no brainer. And then over over like a year or, you know, if we're working together together for three months, we, we have 12 weeks to lock in some really solid habits, drinking water. And if you're 300 pounds, I don't want you to go to the gym for multiple reasons. One, because <clears throat> probably you don't know how to work out. I'm not going to be there with it to help you work out. Two, you probably feel extremely uncomfortable in a gym. Like just to the point of, of like this, like you, do, you don't want to even walk through those doors because you're feeling judged from the moment you get there. So what, you know, just asking the question, what are you willing to that's, do? That's really good unconventional advice too, because most people would think or assume that a trainer would tell a client who's 300 pounds to get in the gym and right. start working out and yeah. lifting weights. And in reality, and I, I drop this stat on the mind pump all the time, which is people don't realize that the, the average American is only stepping about four to 6,000 steps a day. That's fucking insane when you really think about it. Because yeah. if we walked outside right now for one hour, we would step that much. Right. So in other words, the average American doesn't even get an hour's worth of just walking. Not running, not exercising, not jogging, yeah. walking around for an hour straight. We're just in our cars, sitting at our desk, yeah. whatever, all day long. Yeah. 
And just by giving that advice, I think, to somebody who's 300 pounds, yeah. and, I mean, so They're, much. Prob- they're you- probably around 1,000 steps. I've seen people under Yeah, 1, I was going to say 4,000 is probably very, very generous. Right. There's, but there's, you know, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a saying in business is you have to meet your, meet your potential client where they're at, right? It's the same thing in fitness. You have to meet your client where they're at. If I try to tell them to go to a gym, I'm not meeting, with, meeting them where they're at. I'm trying to catapult them into, a, into a, an area of their life that they are not comfortable. Mm-hmm. And what are the chances that they're going to stick with that? Right. Slim to none. So I, you know, every single step of the way, it's what are you willing to do? What are some of the things that you're willing to try? You know, mostly for the physical fitness part. But then, then there's the learning process of how does how does the body process sugar? What is insulin? How you know? And then so they start making informed decisions on what they're putting in their body. I had a client of mine. He drinks this. Uh, what are they called? Uh, that it's like coffee mate, but it's the the international delight, right? Mm-hmm. So he told me first day. He goes, Rob, I'm telling you right now, I am not giving up my coffee. It's like Christmas. Every morning I get to drink a, a big jug of Christmas. It was this. I think it's sixty four ounces. I want Christmas. It's like a Seven Eleven oh, coffee, oh, oh, oh. and he would he would fill the bottom of it up with that International Delight. Oh my god, vanilla uh, just a cool like probably like nine hundred calories worth hazelnut. Of coffee no, it's like it's like calorie free. Oh, so, so just yeah. a bunch oh. of sweet. Oh, it's yeah. artificial yeah. one. Yeah, it's like yeah. So you like uh, you, he he would put that in the bottom of it, and then he would pour in his coffee, and he would have he would have that. And I talked to him about maybe it wasn't the maybe it wasn't the sugar the 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 it's like fat free but but not sugar free okay. right yeah, yeah. it's fat free right, right? so it's a, it's a it's yeah, the it's probably 900 calories of sugar then <laughs> right so but i was said okay so how much are you putting in there because now I, I i was i was on the i was on the phone with him and, and i'm looking on my computer and it's like okay so every tablespoon that you put in there is seven grams of sugar um how many tablespoons are you putting in he goes uh i I have no idea. I just fill up the bottom. You dump it. Yeah. I go, what do you mean you fill up the bottom? He goes, well, there's this like section of the bottom that's like, you know, it's like a cup where it can fit into like my car cup thing. And I just fill that up with the, with the creamer and then I finish it off with coffee. I go, do me a favor. Measure that. See how much sugar you're drinking. So he starts, he, st- he, he does it the next day and he took pictures of it, which is going to be great for when we eventually, when I eventually post this, but like he took pictures of it. It was 72 grams of sugar <laughs> to the, right start first thing his in the day. <sighs> To start his day. Not yeah. only not only that, but you're yeah. you're getting a night you're getting Spe- a, speeding it up with some caffeine to get Well, you're getting you're getting a cortisol boost from the caffeine because yeah. that's what caffeine does. And that's not bad. It depends on time of day and all that stuff and yeah. your body, but you get a little cortisol boost. Then you're boosting your insulin with the sugar. Not necessarily a great combination. And then you probably go sit in your car. So you basically <laughs> think prime yeah, no, your, he goes and sit in his office. He, yeah. he worked from home. So then you just prime your body for getting ready to store. You know, yeah, right? so, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like one of those unicorn so he, you know, so Starbucks. the cool thing was, is he's like, you know what, Rob? Uh, so that he goes, I can't, I can't fucking believe how much sugar I'm drinking. And I said, yeah, the, the average Snickers bar is 25 grams. You're drinking, you're basically starting your day off with 25, tw- with like three Snickers bars. Yeah, it's, mm. that's good analogy right there. Mm. You know, mm. so he's like, oh, that's not smart. Yeah, that's not, that's not healthy. I probably shouldn't do that. So then he, he cut it down. He literally just cut it down to like, I think three tablespoons and l- within the first week he lost like six pounds. I mean, he's 340 pounds to start. Yeah, but, you but know, still, you but, know. but still, and yeah. he was just that, it was just, just that and walking and drinking water. Yeah. And he dropped six pounds the first week. Well, and this just goes back to a lot of what we talk about too, about awareness. Awareness yeah. is, so, mm-hmm. is so, so many yeah. people just do not have the awareness. Mm-hmm. They, are naive to those things. You just, yeah. in your head, you think, oh, it's probably only about this, yeah. you know, whatever, no big yeah. deal. That shit adds up really fast. I, I just started practicing uh, being super aware when I chew my food. It sounds silly. I've been I've talked about this a few times now on the podcast. <laughs> he it's counts a, it. It's, it's a new... Counting. Are you starting counting? <laughs> it's a new thing. No, I'm not counting. I know. But what I'm doing, because I, I, re- I realize the way I eat food, part of it's my childhood. Again, you guys told you my story about how I... Shoveling. You know, yeah, and they put the timer on. So part of it's that, and part of it is because I used to eat like seven meals a day, but I used to also train 10 clients a day. So in between clients, I'd have about five minutes to eat my meal, and I got this amazing technique that I developed over the years <laughs> where I'd have my water, mm. I'd have my food, and I'd get my food on the fork, I'd throw it in my mouth, I'd chew it two three times, wash yeah. it down with water, because I could swallow a, you know, a, a big amount, and so I barely chewed my food and I'd pound it down. Well, now um, I'm chew- and I, 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 because of that, I always needed water with me because I, I developed the habit of not chewing my food. And then I read an article that said that it's probably not a good idea to drink lots of water with your food because it dilutes your stomach acid and it affects your digestion. I've always had digestion, digestion issues. So I started doing that. I said, okay, I'm not going to drink. I'm going to drink water like, you know, beforehand, uh, you know, maybe, you know, 15 minutes before or whatever, and maybe a little bit later afterwards. But during my meal, I'm going to try and drink, go without drinking. And I realized that 
I would choke because I wasn't cho- <laughs> chewing the food enough. Mm-hmm. So I started Jeez. chewing my food a little bit more. And then I started reading about that and how you become more aware of what you're eating. You tend to eat less when you do that and how important chewing is because it's literally the first part of digestion. It's a big part of digestion, right. not a small part. It's a big, we're not alligators. You know what I mean, we're not supposed to swallow food whole. We're supposed to chew it up quite a bit Straight and then swallow the it. Yeah. In well, fact, we evolved that way. So I started doing this. And I started tasting food differently and chewing on it and just savoring it. And I became so much more aware during my meal. I'm like, I'm on my phone less while I'm eating. I'm actually Mm -hmm. eating while I'm eating. And it's made a big difference. So these little things, these little little tiny nuggets of awareness make a huge impact. Yeah. And there was a whole book. I think Adam was telling me there was yeah. a whole book on this where yeah, they did, they, chewing they, your food loose. There's, there's, loose a whole, there's a whole diet that's that's based on And obviously, they take a little bit of good science like that and then they expand They go it. nuts. Yeah, right. and turn exactly. it into a whole diet. It has something to do with like chewing your food like 52 times before you swallow it and you're like guaranteed to lose weight. And, you know, obviously... <laughs> because you're exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I mean, the, the, the real... The you real, burn 600 calories <laughs> with everybody. Well, yeah, and that, the real, that's exactly. The real science Powerful behind it jaws. is you, you, yeah. if you think about it with the average Americans eating three times a day or whatever and if you're chewing x amount more that's x amount more calories burned plus now awareness on what you're consuming plus you're probably not eating fast enough yeah to yes, eat all this exactly. food and, yeah. so it's just like and then people are like oh my god mind blown you yeah. know like that's all i had to do yeah. is chew my <laughs> but you know those little bits of those little bits of awareness they they really make a big difference and they I, really it's, do it's funny when you work with clients and i'm sure you've seen this as, as they start to become more aware uh of what they're eating and what they're doing they start to enjoy uh foods that they didn't necessarily like before. Like, you know, I've had, I had clients that start training and they'd be like, how can you eat broccoli? It's so disgusting. Or how can you eat the, those are so gross. And you know, two years later the, you know, I go over to eat, eat dinner at the house and yeah. we're all eating broccoli and they're enjoying it and they've just yeah. learned to yeah. learn to love it. So yeah, there's, there's uh, that same guy with the, with the coffee, you know, uh, problem. He, uh, <laughs> it's like, okay, we got to get our vegetables in. Okay. So we're going to add one. Let's do, let's start off with just one vegetable a day. What vegetable can you eat? And he's like, broccoli. I like broccoli. I was like, okay, great. And then I started like, I started, uh, he sent me a picture of his broccoli and it had like ketchup all over it. <laughs> and I go, what is this? And he goes, oh, it's my broccoli. Check it out, man. Like I had like a huge plate of broccoli. I go, what is that all on top of it? He goes, oh, that's that's ketchup. I said, why are you putting ketchup on there? Gross. He goes, because it's, it makes it taste really good. <laughs> I said, did you read the sugar content on ketchup? <laughs> you know, he's just like, ah, oh, shit. Yeah. So then he had to like, and I was like, he's like, but I don't like it otherwise. So I was like, well, how are you eating it? Oh, we steam it. Okay, well, maybe we should try it either roasted or sauteed or maybe put some like, you know, saute it with something and, and make it taste good instead of just this bland fucking broccoli that most people <laughs> right. hate, you know, right, just right. boil it. Right. So there's, you have to give people those options, but it's totally true. Like people are... Actually, the, you know, the funny shit. thing is these foods are not actually bland. It's that we've we've been eating these extremely That's palatable right. processed foods for so long. Because remember, these are, you know, these processed foods are engineered. There's lots of yeah. money. In fact, there's more You're money. Competing with Pringles. More money goes into uh, making your food taste a particular way than goes into its nutrition. Actually, very little usually goes into its nutrition. Right. It's mostly how good we can make it taste. So there's all this money that goes into engineering this sell it? extremely palatable food and your brain actually adapts to it. It actually down-regulates receptors that process uh, taste these taste signals so that when you do go eat a natural food, it, your brain perceives it to be bland. Uh, this, this is why people will go on a, a fast and then they'll get out of a fast after three days or whatever and they'll eat a fruit or something and be like, oh my God, this yeah. is exploding with flavor. Well, this is also why high right. sugar eaters tend to not like fruit and vegetables. Right. I mean, I remember I was somebody who didn't eat a lot of fruit and vegetables and it wasn't until I went through my whole competitive phase where I had to eat so strict and I was eating all that. And then when I went and reintroduced those foods, I was like, holy shit, that was way too sweet. That candy's too sweet for me. That soda's too sweet for yeah. me. But oh my God, a, a bite into an apple just seems so rich. But it took that cleaning that system out and actually resetting all those. You know, once That was you re- a big learning learning experience because I did two men's physique competitions like within the same year and I just I just wanted to see if I could do it. And that was that that exact example. Like I remember dialing in my diet and I, there was a guy that I was that I was training that was one of the trainers at my gym. He had done, I don't know, dozens and dozens of, of bodybuilding and physique competitions and he was trying to tell me what to eat and what not to eat. And I just it was only halfway 
doing what he was telling me because he was telling me to basically just eat like white fish and and <laughs> and like asparagus? and asparagus. asparagus. That was yeah. it. And I was like, dude, that, I'm not fucking doing that. Like, so <laughs> I started incorporating more stuff, and I and I got down to about five percent body fat. I did. It was really good. The food always tasted good, but when but the one thing that I did cut out was anything sweet, like no no uh, fruits, no obviously no sugar. Period. And when I when I had a, got a taste of that afterwards, oh yeah. my god, it was like the world. That's what you like. That's what I think people must be must have experienced when like the spring came and some fruit grew on the trees oh, and all of a sudden point. they got a taste of that and they're like oh my god and then they would guzzle that shit down like as yeah. much as possible like they would just get as much in but obviously they were much smaller they're, you know it's like if you eat an apple now it's like it's it's, a, it's, it's, it's been, huge we, we've bred the, we've bred apples and right. fruits to be these just sugar bombs yeah and, but my neighbor has crab apples and those things are disgusting yeah exactly <laughs> exactly no we've yeah. bred we've bred food literally to to become more and more palatable and so yeah. you'll eat fruit and yeah you'll bite into it and they'll breed the sweeter fruit with the more meat and the more sugar in it and yeah yeah it's just it's the world we live into now so it's crazy so looking ahead uh you know with the future of your podcast and what you're looking to do where do you guys where do you hope to be in the in the next in the next like in the next coming years i hope that you know building up the one-on-one uh online clientele i'd like to phase out doing one-on-one training in in the gym my wife and i would like to kind of live a lifestyle of you know we're going to start having kids uh that's something that that's on the radar for us so i would love to be able to uh have a lifestyle where we can just work from home uh or some place that's just ours you know mm-hmm. like a facility like this would be ideal because she does gyrotonic and i do you know the training and if we wanted to build out videos and more uh content marketing you know or content stuff then that would be amazing uh and then the after the one on one probably get into group uh, group training, um, just like with the same philosophy as a lot mm-hmm. of the same stuff that I learned from the one on ones. And then from there, potentially doing like uh, programming and stuff like that. But I'm, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just got to, fi- you know, the whole thing is, is that figuring out what's the best thing to do for the audience, but then at the same time, figuring out what's the best thing to do financially that's going to be able to sustain this lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Well, what's best for the audience will probably be what's best for, right. you know, financially. So, right. excellent, man. It's been, it's been awesome talking to you. It's great. Yeah, to yeah. Have, I really appreciate you guys having me on. Thank now, you. where can people find you? Uh, they can find me at openskyfitness.com. That's my website. If they're, uh, if they're interested in joining the podcast community, it's called Open Sky Fitness Podcast Group on Facebook. That's super easy. And uh, if they are interested in one-on-one coaching, it's just openskyfitness.com uh, slash coaching. Cool. For your, for your audience, obviously, Mind Pump is our podcast, uh, mindpumpmedia.com com is we have all the programs available the ones we talked about on the podcast um, and then Instagram um, is a great place to ask us questions so we actually do Q&A episodes four days a week uh, where we answer questions that come from our Instagram page that Instagram page is Mind Pump Media and then our personal pages are Mind Pump Sal Mind Pump Adam and Mind Pump Justin thank you for listening to Mind Pump if your goal is to build and shape your body dramatically improve your health and energy and maximize your overall performance check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.